everybody. Good morning, everybody. Well, good morning, everybody. Did you know my mother? Did she give good living? Had she been baptized? Well, I've been to the river and I've been baptized. So get converted and I feel all right. Did you feel all right? Yes. Did you feel all right? Yes. Did you feel all right? Yes. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the loophole of retreat, Venice, day one. We are deeply honored that so many of you have traveled so far to be with us today, to be a part of this historic convening this weekend in Venice. And as you know, Loophole of Retreat Venice is conceived as an extension of artist Simone Lee's U.S. Pavilion Exhibition Sovereignty on view now across the canal in the Giardini of the Venice Biennale. This symposium brings together an eminent group of black women intellectuals, scholars, artists, writers, poets, filmmakers, and activists from around the world for three days of dialogue, performances, and presentations centered on black women's intellectual and creative labor. Loophole of Retreat Venice builds on the eponymous one day convening held in 2019 at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York City. The conceptual frame is drawn from the 1861 autobiography of Harriet Jacobs, a formerly enslaved woman who for seven years after her escape lived in a crawl space she described as a loophole of retreat. Jacobs claimed this site as simultaneously an enclosure and a space for enacting practices of freedom, practices of thinking, planning, writing, and imagining new forms of freedom. Over the past year, I have had the great honor of curating this iteration of Loophole of Retreat with guidance from advisors Sadia Hartman and Tina Camp, who curated the original conference with Simone. We are amazed by the talent and intellectual rigor of this group of women who will be featured in our program over the next three days, and honored and grateful that they said yes to our invitation to be a part of Loophole Venice. The Loophole program features over 65 inspired black women and femmes who hail from around the globe, representing the depth and breadth of the African diaspora. We have participants from across the US and Canada, participants from throughout the Caribbean, including Jamaica, Haiti, Puerto Rico, and St. Croix, as well as Brazil, participants from the UK and countries across Europe, including Italy, and participants hailing from countries throughout Africa, including Nigeria, South Africa, Morocco, Mali, and Sao Tome and Principe. And we know that many of you have traveled from far and wide to be here, as well for which we are most grateful. We have designed this transnational gathering in the precedent of those convenings set by Festac 77 in Lagos <laughs> and Deborah Willis Black Portraits in Johannesburg and many other places. Understanding the continued and urgent need for transnational solidarity and collaboration during this critical moment for women's rights, climate and environmental justice, racial justice, decolonization, land back, and the fight against the resurgence of fascism. 
we built this platform for global dialogue. One of the incredible guiding ethos of Simone's practice is her insistence on both the individual authorship of black women and also the necessity of collectivity. Rather than ask why the appropriate platforms do not exist for black women intellectuals, Lupola of Retreat is tasked to create them. Simone has often spoken. <laughs> Simone has often spoken about black women artists of previous generations who worked their entire lives without a museum exhibition. And so the loophole of retreat makes visible this intergenerational and interdisciplinary relationships and practices that make the practices like her own and many of ours possible. In the spirit of the original loophole conference, each participant was issued an open-ended invitation to speak about her own work and highlight topics of her own interests or expertise. In fact, an early alternate title for loophole was carte blanche, reflecting the ethos of freedom that Simone wished to animate the event. As a larger framework for the constellation of presentations you'll encounter here, however, we have identified a group of key directives to guide our collective thinking. These are marunage. Maroons refer to the people who escaped slavery and created independent communities on the outskirts of enslaved societies. This directive for Lupo Venice is inspired by the artist Deborah Anzinger's explorations of fugitivity and resistance in Jamaica's cockpit country, which is a site of historical refuge and resistance for Maroons. Manual, meaning of or pertaining to the hand or hands. This directive is inspired by the Manual for General Housework from Sadia Hartman's Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, Intimate Histories of Social Upheaval. Magical realism. Rather than only a literary genre, magical realism as defined by Caribbean poet and theorist Kamal Brathwaite is a larger cacophonous movement with multiple representations the plural instant and collective improvisation, a radical disruption of Western progressivist history. Magically real forms are the music, literature, and movement languages developed by black people in the New World as a result of the catastrophes of colonialism and the Middle Passage, and as an alternative to insanity. Medicine. This directive is inspired by how we cope with the natural and supernatural world around us using the qualities of science, plants, and animals. It draws on our approaches to diverse ailments, physical, spiritual, natural, and supernatural. For this gathering, we consider the, root, the work of root and leaf doctors, traditional healers, and conjurers of the rural Black American South and the Global South. And finally, Sovereignty. The title of the US Pavilion Exhibition, Sovereignty Speaks to Notions of Self-Determination, Self-Governance, and Independence for both the intellectual and the collaborative, and the individual and the collaborative. We have to acknowledge, again, that we are only here because of those who made it possible to be here and the lives and work of our ancestors. So as I read the names of some specific black women intellectuals, curators, artists who have made this possible, I would invite you to also add your names and we speak them together. Peggy Cooper K. Fritz. B.C. Silva. Harriet Jacobs. Valerie Maynard, <laughs> Bell Hooks, <laughs> Dominique Malaquay, Arlene Burke Morgan, Robbie McCauley, Blondell Cummings, Samella Lewis, Ammonia Lewis, Tony K. Bambara, 
Edna Manley, Pearl Primus, Tony Morrison, Audra Lord, Abby Lincoln, Catherine Dunham, Sevilla Fort, Zora Neale Hurston, Leah Green, Nancy Lane, Octavia Butler, Betty Davis, Josephine Baker, Ethel Morris, Miriam Makiba, Elza Suarez, Big Mama Thornton, Billy Holiday, Dr. Josephine English, Betty Shabazz, Ella Fitzgerald, Elizabeth Catlett, Consuela Harris, and please say additional names. Thank you. Before we be begin with our programming today, I want to orient you to how the next few days will unfold and share a few housekeeping notes. Loophole of Retreat Venice is pleased to be hosted at the Fondia, I, I can never say it right, so please excuse me. <laughs> um, the Cheney Foundation. <laughs> Here on the island of San Giorgio Maggiore. Lupo programming will take place throughout several venues across the Cheney Foundation campus. So this morning we will begin with the full slate of programming here in the Sala de Glarazzi, the symposium's main lecture hall, with a series of talks and presentations. Following a musical performance from Lisa Marie Simmons, we will break for lunch at 1.30. During the lunch break, you can purchase food from our vendors in the courtyard, and or attend a performance by Paloma McGregor. At 2.30, we will resume programming with film screenings and conversations and talks here in the Arazzi, and our performance program will begin in the theater located in the Ex Piscina Gandini, which is down this path, as well as Paloma's performance. So there will be people to direct you, as well as signage. All day long, a looped film program will be screening in the Sala del Chioso di Cipressi. You can find a map of these spaces on your brochure and loophole hostesses stations throughout the grounds can help guide you to the various venues. For the performance in the Ex Piscina Gandini, please plan to arrive 15 minutes ahead of the scheduled start time. The nearby Sala di Capriati will also serve as a lounge space and an overflow seating for the programming here in the Arazzi, which will be live streamed there. To that end, I wish to note that we have more ticketed attendees than we have seats in any individual program roomed here at the conference. We therefore encourage you to circulate to the various spaces throughout the day. We ask that you please do not leave your things or otherwise save your seat here when you leave this room in order to allow for others to, experiencing, to experience the programming. We also ask you to kindly silence your cell phones. Um, and please note that the conference will be live streamed and the proceedings will be photographed and recorded. We want to thank our many sponsors and there is a totem that thanks all of the sponsors that supported um, both Simone's exhibition and also Loophole, but specifically uh, we want to thank Simone Lee who supported a lot of the conference herself. together with Matthew Marks Gallery. Um, and also the Lambent Foundation. Um, the Ford Foundation. And Goldman Sachs for the One, billion, one Million Black Women's Program. One billion, but we are one billion <laughs> loophole participants around the world. One second. 
Um, and the, the fuller biographies um, for all of the participants can be found on the website, which is SimoneLeeVenice2022.org. Uh, but what I would like to first do um, is really, without further delay, get into the program. So I'm honored to briefly introduce the first hours of presenters at Loophole of Retreat Venice. Um, throughout the rest of the day, we are really honored that the participants will be introduced by students from Spelman College. They recently participated in a seminar entitled Simone Lee Art in Theory, which is led by Cheryl Finley. So we're so happy to have them here and to have their participation. We will start the day hearing from Vanessa Agar Jones, who is Assistant Professor of Anthropology at Columbia University, where she is affiliated with the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies. With a focus on black life in the Atlantic world, she conducts historical and ethnographic research on racialization, environmental degradation, and the politics of gender and sexuality. Deborah Anzinger is an artist and the founder of New Local Space in Kingston, Jamaica. Her work has been exhibited internationally in museums, including a solo presentation at the ICA Philadelphia in 2018. Kinesia Lubrin is a writer, editor, and teacher based in Whitby, Canada. Her books include Voodoo Hypothesis and the forthcoming Code Noir. She teaches at the University of Guelph, where she coordinates a creative writing MFA program in the School of English and Theater Studies. <laughs> Mabel O. Wilson teaches architecture and black studies at Columbia University, where she also serves as director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies. Amongst her books are Negro Building, Black Americans in the World of Fairs and Museums. Her installation, A Way Station, The Architectural Spaces of Urban Migration, is on view at SF MoMA through May 2023. Thank you. Good morning. What an honor it is to be here today, to be in this moment with all of you, and to be the beneficiary in so many ways of the brilliance that is Simone Lee, whose work and whose friendship has moved so many of us across oceans, through space, and beyond time. Thank you to Rashida Bumbre for gathering us with such prescience and skill and grace and to Saidia Hartman and Tina Camp, to Rebecca Adib and Susan Thompson and Emily Mello, and to the whole team that has made this gathering possible. I'm so thrilled to share this window of conversation with Kinesia, Deborah, and Mabel, and so look forward to hearing each of their words. Thank you, too, to the young people uh, who inspire my small one to be here in this beloved community. Uh, and thank you to Georgia May. Uh, for being a travel partner whose patience, flexibility, and rapturous engagement with the world is unrivaled. I'm so deeply moved to be here. So what I'd like to share this morning is from an essay that I'm currently writing called Gone to Ground. One, of a fox or other animal, to enter its earth or burrow, as in, rabbits evicted from one set of burrows will go to ground elsewhere. Two, of a person, to hide, go into seclusion or become inaccessible, especially for a long time. As in, she had gone to ground following the coup. How have you survived? How have you maintained during this collective adaptation? Tiffany Lathabo King asked a group of us gathered for a virtual conversation this spring. Riffing on Octavia Butler's use of the term collective adaptation, describing the kinds of rapid evolution she both imagined and observed in the face of world historical change, Butler summoned adaptive visions for futures to be made for horizons to come. How have we survived? How have me and my now five-year-old weathered these last disabling, debilitating, disorienting years? We have gathered ourselves and the smallest circles of our people, was my reply. We've gone to ground. I'd like to ask you to think with me today about the possibilities that going to ground might open up 
for those of us who care about survivance, about sovereignty, about freedom, and like Sylvia Winter, about seeking a reconstructed understanding of the very grounds of human being. We come from long traditions of reaping from the ground, sustaining ourselves with ground provision, harvesting bush medicine, and of making fallow land fertile fields. But how might going to ground in this period make possible something we urgently need now? Zora Neale Hurston calls plants ground thoughts. She writes, I reckon my longing to get away makes me feel this way. I feel that I am just earth, soil lying helpless to move myself, but thinking. I seem to hear herds of big beasts like horses and cows thundering over me and rains beating down and wind sweeping furiously over, all acting upon me, but me, well, just soil, feeling but not able to take part in it all. Then a soft wind like love passes over and warms me, and a summer rain comes down like understanding and softens me, and I push a blade of grass or a flower or maybe a pine tree. That's the ground thinking. Plants are ground thoughts because the soil can't move itself. What might it mean to feel like earth, like soil lying helpless to move itself, like ground as a site for thinking, like plant as the instantiation of our visions of ourselves and of our world? In this 1921 short story, John Redding Goes to Sea, Hurston asks us to consider the limitations of linking freedom dreams to mobility and liberation to lines of flight. Instead, she trains our attention on the most immobile of subjects and sites, the ground inhabited by the vast majority of us, by black folks who experience inordinate material and geophysical barriers to our abilities to physically move. She reimagines those grounds as fertile, generative sites for feeling, and perhaps more importantly, for thinking. Our grounds might push a blade of grass or a flower or a pine tree into the world. And for Hurston, each is a carrier of ground wisdom about the world. Botanists have long studied plant physiology and now offer us intriguing insights into plant signaling and intelligence. Plant ecologists continue to microscale into the environments that bring plant and animal life into relation. Contemporary scholars in critical plant studies ask more elusive questions about herbaceous modes of being and becoming that loop us back through time to older philosophical questions about vitality and the constitution of life. My own thinking about sentient soil and about the vegetation that emerges from it is deeply influenced by the work of Hurston and that of Suzanne Césaire, two figures emblematic of traditions of black feminist inquiry, Anglophone and Francophone, ethnographic and literary, forged in times of world historical transformation, not unlike our own. Taken together, they offer us a reflection on representations of the primitive and the plant, and invested instead in metaphors, uh, I'm sorry, resistant to the pitfalls of tropicalizing representations of the primitive and the plant, and invested instead in metaphors materiality, and as Annie Curtius highlights for us, to its possible horizons as method. Plants emerge here as subjects rather than mere objects. They are not just good to think, but are modes of inhabitation we are wise to remember were once part of the cycle of our being and will again irremediably be our own. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes, ashes to sand, sand to rock, rock to clay, clay to soil, soil to plant. Suzanne Césaire, in her own turn, calls us homme plant, or plant people. In a 1942 essay in Tropique, the journal she, her husband Aimé, and fellow writers and theorists René Menil, Lucie Thézé, and Aristide Moget ran in World War II, Vichy occupied Martinique. Annette Joseph Gabriel interprets Césaire's invocation thus. The homme plant is one who does not seek to dominate nature, but rather allows himself to be possessed moved along by the force of life. For Suzanne Césaire, the Martinican homme plante rejects the impulse to conquer and dominate and refuses the violent, destructive impulse that fueled the war machine of the 1940s. For Césaire, that period of life demanded an urgent task. As she wrote, it is now vital to dare to know oneself, to dare to confess to oneself what one is, to dare to ask oneself what one wants to be, here also people are born, live, and die. Here also the entire drama is what uh, is played out. 
both a call for Martinican liberation and an affirmation of the political centrality of non-European places, Suzanne Césaire insisted that despite its small size and seeming global insignificance, Martinique was an arena in which a more universal question of freedom might find meaningful elaboration. And for her, that happened under the sign of the plant. Refusing a reduction of post-plantation freedom dreams to a base form of, pure, of bureaucratic political parity, Suzanne Césaire's recuperation of the vegetal offers us something prescient in our orientation toward a wider set of decolonial desires. Her invocation of the vegetal is a refusal of the monocrop plantation economy, and it demand instead for a rhythm of universal life unstructured by the plantation form. Together, Hurston and Césaire offer us a vision for what it might mean to think ourselves not merely as consumers, tenders, or laborers in the world of plants, but as being closer to plant life than we often imagine. If plants are ground thoughts, going to ground is a demand for a politics that both takes on board the consequences of colonial incursion and forges new modes of relationality between plants and people. Together, they also insist that we attend to moments in human life that verge, as Michael Martyr observes, on the vegetal. Betsy Ann Wansley Young spent the last years of her life, nearly a decade of them, bedbound, unable to move her body on its right side, for a time only able to murmur, and then eventually unable to speak. Before those years, she was a founding member of the staff of People Magazine, a photographer and editor with a love of brandy and of brie, both the consumables and her Yorkshire Terriers, one named for each. She was my mother's older and only sibling and my beloved taunt, the adult who I clung to in my early years. They called us Big Toot and Little Toot. Um, and, oh, sorry, I'm weeping. I didn't realize I was gonna do that. Um, uh, thank you, <laughs> thanks. Uh, they called us Big Toot and Little Toot. Uh, until in 1985, she was diagnosed with multiple meningiomas, non-malignant tumors of the brain and spinal cord that, at the time, were near impossible to treat. When surgery after surgery chipped away at her brain's gray matter, she ended up spending years verging on what medical practitioners formally, formally call a vegetative state. Our meninges, the places where her tumors were lodged, have three layers. The inner, fragile pia mater, the webby arachnoid middle filled with fluid, and the outer shell, true to its name, the dura mater. In the hierarchy of vertebrate and invertebrate animal life, forms of meninges help define the orders, the ranks, the lethal categories of valuation that have long made mess of human and non-human relation in the so-called West. Our meninges matter to how we think the order of our worlds, yet, our pia mater is the site of capillary action, bringing blood to the brain and spinal cord. The self-same mechanism in plants, capillary action, draws water from roots to xylem, stamen to, to stem. Annie Dillard reminds us that there is only a tiny difference between the lifebloods of plants and animals. One molecule of chlorophyll contains 36 atoms of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon, arrayed around an atom of magnesium. A molecule of hemoglobin is exactly the same, differentiated only by a single atom, iron for magnesium. And via capillary action, all of our bodies defy gravity. When this action is blocked for humans, when riddled with masses of unanticipated cell growth like tumors, that twinning becomes even more profound. From the outside, we seem to start to verge on the vegetal. My taunt's body moves slowly toward this state of being, eventually ceasing all manner of primary and secondary function. But before that, when I came to sit by her bedside, when her husband translated her grunts and gestures to me, her eyes lit up, that mind, those ground thoughts, still there. Like Martha in Audre Lorde's epic poem about a former lover, bedbound, moving slowly toward death too, her thoughts not over, Lord writes, no one you were can come cl so close to death without dying into another Martha. You cannot get closer to death than this Martha, the nearest you've come to living yourself. My child asks after my taunt about death, 
about what happens to bodies when we go, about what happens to minds. I have few answers for her, but I do have this. We go to ground. I watch as she lays in what she calls the grassy place near our home and wonder what she imagines of her body's relation to soil, of her thinking self's kinship to the vibrant ecologies beneath her, of the ground that greets her now and one day will again. Going to ground can happen in so many ways, mostly involuntary, defined by both individual and population level scales of injury, collective debilitation, and hands forced with earth swallowing imagined as punishment rather than prize. Since the year 2000, my aunt has been the inhabitant of a plot at Flushing Cemetery in Queens, itself once a center of horticultural innovation, shared with her parents and grandmother. Now a crepe myrtle grows between their gravestones. Taunt has gone to ground, and among the living, so have I. I would wager that so many of us uh, gathered here too, having recently experienced a, parad a paradigmatic slowing of a delirious pace of being in the world, of our social media signaling, our schedule packing, our social frenzy, our endless laboring in the service of corporate profit, um, as earlier phases of the pandemic, in some places at some times, decelerated the velocity of life such that our actions became barely perceptible. How have we survived this collective adaptation? We have gathered ourselves in the smallest circles of our people, and we have gone to ground. And what an opportunity we now have to hear what kinds of vegetal efflorescence of ground thoughts this gathering might now bring to life. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> what a privilege to follow Vanessa's talk and to be here with everyone. Thank you, Simone Lee. Thank you, Rashida Bomri. Thank you to the entire loophole of retreat team for working your magic so that we could all be here together. I'm going to start my presentation with a short excerpt from Mayal, written by Erna Broadbow. Nick, I think we can play for a minute and then pause. Long conversations between herself took place in her head, mostly accusations. He took everything I had away, made what he wanted of it and gave me back nothing. It was you who let him take everything. You gave him everything. But I didn't even know when I was giving it that it was mine and my everything. How could you not have known? Mule, with blinders on. You wouldn't listen, you wouldn't see. Can we pause there? That's a monologue where Ella has suffered a breakdown, a splitting of herself. Mile is the same novel that the quote that was on the screen is from. On one level, the novel tells the story of a community dealing with two cases of spirit thievery being, being experienced by two young women in their rural community in a small town in Jamaica. One theft being by an unsuspected black male elder who in spirit has crept into the bed of young Anita in a desperate attempt to regain his virility. The other instance is by a white American husband of Ella who she's taken from Jamaica to meet in the US, away from her black farm worker mother where she now passes for white and serves as a muse for her white American husband's minstrel shows. On another, on another level, Mayal tells the story of the subversive, largely unseen, largely unspoken, but retained ancestral ways that a marginal community, led by Miss Gatha, who Broadbow describes as a systemic force, a coconut tree in a private hurricane, this community reorganizes for itself the relationships between race, gender, and class that have been imposed on it from slavery. I think we can start playing again. The, this unspoken retention itself is a type of marinage. I've highlighted the quote, though, on the screen that you saw before because it points to a birthing moment in Mayal that occurred almost entirely in an outwardly unspoken spiritual domain. 
whereas the passage I read, Ella's monologue, speaks to the economy of life and how imperial colonial extractive social constructs organize that economy and even become internalized, which is the point of departure for my, for my work as an artist. While Wilson Harris, who you saw, who, whose review you saw a brief image of, himself is a writer of black and indigenous reorganization through magical realism in post-independence Guyana, states in a review he wrote of Erna Bradbaugh's work, is it not possible to see Ella as the victim of an enlightenment that has long concentrated in the humanities on patterns of behaviorism as a logical field in itself? For me though, the passage that I read to you resonates in a first-hand way, lived reality. I responded viscerally as if it was a memory of a conversation I once had had with myself. A voyage of the psyche, as Harris puts it. That same economy of life that precipitates Ella's breakdown is what black geographer Daniel Purifoy gets at directly in her essay, Birthing from the Bottom. Purifoy states, the bottom is the entanglement of black peoples with the extraction and commodification of natures for the development of wealth and power, for the sustaining of white dominated political space. Per Charles Mills, the Jamaican American political philosopher, the black peoples and spaces constituting the bottom are construed as the morally debased and waste producing parts of the body politic. In other words, as a wilderness to be acted upon by civilized white space. Black people under this white imaginary are thus part of an undifferentiated, extractable resource. Such is the character of the continuing plantation economy per Jamaican economist George Beckford. The replication of colonialism and its ecology onto contemporary landscapes through new configurations of resource extraction and wealth production. Through isolating consolidated power and wealth so far from the sites of production and reality that its holders believe they can survive without the bottom indeed without a functioning planet. Purifoy lays it out. The conditions generated by these configurations indicate with some certainty that this system cannot continue. When it crumbles, what will emerge? The constitutive subordination and thingification of black peoples and nature requires not only a rearticulation of black liberation, but also a major change in the characterization and valuation of natures. The bottom, Daniel Purifoy tells us in black feminist tradition is the space where possibility exists for true revolutionary loving liberation. My work as an artist concerns itself with this recharacterization and revaluation re of nature's Purifoy right self in an evolving material experimentation to develop a syntax that centers and shifts the ways that black, that, that black female embodiment is paralleled with land. Shifting this value through aesthetics and praxis driven by the question, what are the ways of, for this revaluation to feed back in a life-giving way to the local reality of the fertile, fecund wilderness situated at the bottom, ecologically, socioeconomically, and spiritually? For me, aesthetics, can we pause here, Nick? Aesthetics is a means of thinking through these ideas, but also a point of departure to move beyond the limitations of art and symbolism. Thinking about feeding this fertile wilderness, I started working on an institute sculpture project in Maroon Town, St. James, called Training Stations last year, in Jamaica, called Training Stations. And I started this last year through the Soros Arts Fellowship and later as part of the UPenn Just Futures Initiative. We can resume. On historical familial land that my great grandparents bought at, the t at about the time that Africans could legally do so in Jamaica. The space carries that family history, but also a history tied to emancipation from slavery. The environs of Maroon Town is where many Africans escaped to and hid from, from West Coast plantations. It's where battles of the Maroon Wars between runaways, Africans, and colonial British forces were fought and won by Africans. And it's where the infamous Maroon Peace Treaty was signed, granting autonomy of the cockpit country from the British Constitution in 1738. And today, the cockpit country is a target for mining. I want to pause right here. Training stations, which you saw uh, an image of just now, um, and you saw some uh, weaving activities happening in, involves efforts to archive, reforest, and make space for forms of ancestral knowledge 
through sculpture and craft. It involves an effort to relate to natures in an equitable and ecologically generative way. Thinking about fertility, labor, and the erotic potential, and appending its relationship to mining, began, began as, an, as aesthetic gestures in my past work. We can replay again. The loaded meanings and values of the particular phenotypes I refer to in the work, such as Afro kinky hair, living plants, are brought to the fore when confronted with, with reflections of the viewer in the system of aesthetic reorganization. And through abstraction, there's a denial of access to the body of the subject in the work, even as the erotic potential is at play. I'm going to get back to what I'm working on currently in the studio, but um, first I wanted to change gears. Um, these are some images of, of past work. I'm going to change gears to thinking broadly about working in ways that create tangible v value shifts that feed back into the local socioeconomic reality and the kinds of environments we create for ourselves. Can we pause? In a life-giving way through art practices. A few years after completing grad school, I moved back home to Kingston where I started new local space. The structure of NLS came to be largely in response to the realities of being an artist in Jamaica. There being no public funding you could apply to, no art residency programs, or no type of incubatory support system that was present. Through working with NLS, there are a number of important art practices that we've been lucky enough to encounter and to help support. And with each residency or fellowship, the project, with each residency or fellowship project, the issue of equity always comes up in some way. The diversity of art practices and experience, experiences means that we collectively and continually have to roll that issue around, seeing it from a number of positionalities, looking at the challenges and the way forward. Responsibility for and accountability to each other has helped to facilitate this and build it into a model of residences and fellowships that we continue to try to adapt to help um, provide that incubatory support after art school for local artists. So I want to start first with Sasha K. Hines. Um, we can play. Sasha K. Hines' work. Sasha K. Hines works through performance. She's a recent graduate of the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts. And she works through performance, video, and photography moving from interrogating her own experience, experiences with teen pregnancy to exploring broader themes of failure and pain in relationships, attending quests for joy and freedom. In her own words, she draws from the insecurity of intimate narratives, complicating notions of self-identity and intersectional feminism, feminism, embracing mystery, solitude, and what she refers to as sass, to propose layered and complicated notions of beauty. Importantly, her work also shines a light on the lack of legislative support for child protection, reproductive rights, and victims of abuse in Jamaica. Sasha Kay just recently completed a residency at NLS um, during the pandemic, during the, I guess, the lockdowns is what I should say, because we, I guess, technically we still are in a pandemic. And, um, and she's currently in an exhibition uh, that we had that just opened last week at NLS called Citing Black Girlhood. Right now, um, we have ongoing workshops with Sasha Kay and a cohort of young women who've just graduated from Edna Manley College to work with them to apply, to work with them so that they can prepare their applications for graduate school. And then we have Joni Gordon, who also recently um, completed a residency at NLS, who deconstructs her experience as an immigrant worker in the US State Department's work and travel 
program, which recruits tertiary students from low and middle income countries to work for minimum wage in the US. The program describes itself as a means for cultural exchange and financial empowerment to afford education in the students' home countries. But through her work, Joni provides a counter-narrative of debt and discrimination that underpins these programs, fleshing out the link between geopolitical power, racial discrimination, and the realities of individuals who live in the global south, as well as the personal trauma. So in terms of support structures, specific, specifically for individual residency, NLS provides a $300,000 um, JMD work stipend, 24-hour access to the studio space for 10 to 12 weeks, um, professional studio visits, and a solo exhibition. Can we pause right here? The Curatorial and Art Writing Fellowship follows a similar model with a work stipend and a committee of mentors who offers guidance in terms of methods, inquiry, and practical concerns with exhibition planning. And then we have a podcast program that works in tandem with the residencies and fellowships. Okay, I wanted to pause here um, to talk a bit about one other practice, uh, well, two in one, really. Um, I hope to talk about two practices at the same time. Um, recently, I mentioned that we had an exhibition citing black girlhood, um, presented in partner with UPenn and University of Johannesburg at NLS. And we invited four women artists in Jamaica whose practices are invested in black female subjecthood to create a portrait of a young woman in her life, collaborating with her in its making. And Onika Russell created a portrait of her past student, Michaela Garrick, also inviting Garrick to contribute her own autobiographical work to the exhibition. And that's a picture of Michaela on the right. In Onika Russell's statement about Michaela, she says, I first met Michaela when I was offering a workshop titled Life After Art School. One of the points of the workshop, as I've learned through my own practice, is to ensure that self-care and rest are an integral part of the process. I noticed that Michaela was nodding about this during the lecture. I met her again at the opening of her final year show and her installation was a space made from woven sugar cane. We can play. Woven sugar cane at the center where beds laid out under the open sky. Michaela shared her struggles to reconcile her childhood, living on Money Musk Plantation with her mother, a worker on the plantation, the tensions and traumas of family heritage tied to the plantation, paternal absenteeism, physical and mental awareness, and a need for healing. Michaela's work, however, was intricately crafted for other women to find refuge. Through her story and her work, she echoes in a specific but very central way how black girls often carry an exhaustion through life from all that we fight through, often for others. I make this work to celebrate the many young women I have taught who have had to overcome great hurdles to pursue a creative career. Often this creative practice is its own path to being comfortable, finding rest and peace with oneself and one's experience. Okay, um, I ended that on um, the current work in the studio, um, which I just wanted to briefly talk about. A lot of the planting being done involves learning about how the land has changed and what Vanessa says really resonates with me on that and the new challenges this presents. Um, so far we've planted over 300 trees, um, including cashew, blue maho, mahogany, cedar, and avocado. And I'll end by coming back to this image that I, I showed in the beginning from that recent body of work of paintings with cook shop, charcoal, and essential but undervalued and loosely protected natural resource in Jamaica. Again, the question of physically shifting how we see the value of resources. How does our, va how, how does our value for charcoal transform with a change in the perspective of seeing it as an essential fuel for survival in local marginal economies to seeing it as a luxury consumer byproduct whose value is tied to parameters removed from the local realities of black people living in the global south? What is the potential of that shift to feed that fecund wilderness? Thank you. Good morning, loophole of retreat, Venice. So lovely to see you all. I'd just like to thank Vanessa and Deborah for setting the path so brilliantly. 
Um, and I'm looking forward to Mabel's brilliant landing, I'm sure. Um, I just a quick thank you also to Rashida Bambre and the Loophole of Retreat Peoples uh, and Simone Lay for this gathering. Uh, what a beautiful thing that we are all here. In 1685, King Louis XIV, King Louis XIV decreed Les Codes Noirs, the Black Codes, 59 articles designed to set the conditions by which enslaved Africans should exist in the French Empire. Today I will read excerpts from My Code Noir, 59 fictions that depart each from one of the original codes. Article 47, husband, wife, and prepubescent children, if they are all under the same master, may not be taken and sold separately. We declare the seizing and sales that shall be done as such to be void. For slaves who have been separated, we desire that the seller shall risk their loss, and that the slaves he kept shall be awarded to the buyer without him having to pay any supplement. The story is called The Keeper of the Dates. The woman keeps all her dates in a black room. You enter the room barefoot. She is standing at the front of the room beside a single white Roman pedestal. Upon it rests a statue of a golden chien, its rust dark tongue curled up to the height of her palm. She relaxes her hand on the statue. She pets it. We have been told she remembers everything there ever was. She does not welcome anyone to the auction. There will be no such exchange of protocols, and we do not expend the silence to express outwardly that we are grateful. It was a strange respite from wasting our lives in the lingering noise of men who had arbitrarily determined what was important enough to be ritual. As we wait, a recording begins on loop. Sit, sit, sit down. Good, out, in, get out now, no, stay. Good, 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 no, no, I said no, stay, yes. A loud, prolonged wind, full of sibilant S's, enters the room and hovers as though it had been expunged from a watery cavern and we needed to learn its constitution. Who's hungry? Against this soundtrack, she begins the auction and a crew of men wearing velvet blindfolds and striped suits begin to bid on the dates. A small light falls through a hole in the ceiling. When she is done with the language of the dates, her skin glistens, onyx, but I don't think she sweats. I did not feel anything extraordinary about the dates, but still, I thought I would throw some research to the wind. I memorized the dates as best I could, and then we left with the feeling that we were traveling toward a wind that would scatter our lives beyond any manageable scope that we were not allowed to enter the room with anything, not even the clothes we wore, seemed enough for my already dead heart, here only to witness, to bear. 233 years from the day of the auction, in a place called Code Noir, risking the dark, you will find the date's mutations and an arrow illuminating a path through the dark. This next story is called Clock Towers, and it departs from Article 25. 
quote, the masters will be required to provide each slave for each year two linen cloths or four linen yards at the discretion of the masters, unquote. Clock towers. The wheel is inside it, and I push the wheel. In the dark green eve, the wheel rolls with a slowness along a thick twine that hangs on the two diagonal joists. The wheel comes to rest on a notebook held up on a banister and covered with a round piece of black linen. The notebook is said to have belonged to the invisible girl who lived in the attic before my great grandparents who were put there by a previous owner of this big farmhouse, the illegitimate son of an invisible man. Time here is a theory kept separate from everything visible beyond the plantations. Next to the banister, the window lies open, and I can hear the birds, a black-faced grass quit, maybe two corn birds, a tinamu making its solos, several pigeons and ground doves. I envy their thousands of days spent together as I clean the persistent dust off the clothed notebook and the banister, even as I did not live dirtily, and I have no other companion with whom to soil the days. I've spent excessive hours wondering at the leisurely dust, how it gathers on the notebook, the few pieces of furniture I live with, their duty, I suppose, is also to catch the dirt of our lives. Such unwanted accumulation works to reject every tool the hand can employ against the dust. But here I am, at the carnival of orange hues budding on every surface, and I must wash myself with a few scheduled days for keeping the notebook, above all, clean. There's nothing unnatural about the dust, of course, but the notebook I have kept clean for 10 decades. It is the only thing here I can touch with feathers, but never with flesh. So I keep it covered with this piece of black linen, the black that shows everything, no matter how invisible, always. In three hours, I will dissolve, and the invisible girl will return. And so it goes that in 100 years, I will come back, narrating every free second, binding the volumes of our lives from the dust. Article two, quote, all the slaves who will be in our islands will be baptized and educated in the Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman religion. We enjoin the inhabitants who by who by newly arrived Negroes to warn the governors and stewards of the said islands with a week at the latest on pain of an arbitrary fine, who will give the, nece the necessary orders to have them educated and baptized in due time." Unquote. This one is called Earth in the Time of Aimé Césaire. On the day we came back from the end of the world, we found a note under your bed. One must begin somewhere. And the final one I will read <laughs> is called The Project, and it departs from Article 40. The slave who has been punished with death based on denunciation by his master or who is not a party to the crime for which he was condemned, shall be assessed prior to his execution by two of the principal citizens of the island named by a judge. The assessment price shall be paid by the master, and in order to satisfy this requirement, the intendant shall impose said sum on the head of each Negro. The amount levied in the estimation shall be paid for each 
of the said Negroes and levied by the taxed farmer of the royal western lands to avoid costs. The project. First, the architect poured some rum. Into four short glasses went rum and our names. And the architect said, each of you has choice. Do what feels good. Sometimes, the architect promptly left us to continue a conversation she was having with the cat, bronze-colored with stripes of gray and white on its head. The cat, already familiar with the imperfections of the species, glanced at the moth and then at the artist, as if from a distance, as if the cat only registered the architect's voice as an echo. By then, our hesitations were no longer about where we were going. We knew we would stop here on our way to India. We knew also that we needed no knowledge of flight. The architect who had countersigned our caravan said the project's purpose was to help, and that is why we are going, traveling with monkey rope toward the ocean again. There's always a project pointing to somewhere which tells us, go. And we had not yet learned that in every new place, we'd need to learn again what it means to move quickly. Neither the fish nor the dying world should deter us from speed, the architect said. I had never lived in a dead world. I'd lived in a shroud by the roadside shore but a dead world I did not want to test, just as I did not want to test what is at the beginning of time, or what can break skin and leave speech weak. Let's go, let's go, let's go, the architect said, and we left. On that hill from which we could see the troubles of the world announced in the surf, in the shadows of the mangrove, in the Harmattan dust lusting after the ocean, there was Roseau, still glowing with something severe, something saturated in the language and the characteristics of any world. I was born there too, already beyond the trick that luxury could be enough to stop an ulcer eating into the most hostile place inside us. We waited. All of this left some of us unsure of the conclusive safety of a beautiful place. But who could blame Roseau? I could not. Sometimes, this feeling of always moving towards some safety, it, depend, it deepened the feeling of a hand disappearing from my life when I most needed to hold onto something that would steady me. Whatever the project, I disliked agendas. We had stopped where the moth found us caught in someone else's narcissism, someone who spoke calmly to complain about the world. The moth, too beautiful to live, leave out of this account, was in her third trimester of an episode, the artist called it. And though the moth did not enjoy having to compete with the cat for the artist's attention, it was war again. It was war that sent us on a permanent visitation with rainy mornings and the gossiping ground. So we knew that the ocean was the best place for us. The ocean might consider our directions and might not reject our passage. Soon we would arrive and the victories of others would not be ours to report. And we'd made our assignations for safe passage in secret on pieces of paper which we burned, all of them, in a small fire on the shore. And having done that, we attached ourselves to a struggle with these several yards before we met the ship. We knew this time we would enter willingly. We knew such a fight could be lost before it began. And I would not mind that we were so tired, if not for the night already beginning to record our visit here, to know us intimately to keep our traces among its reserves. 
we could not risk leaving such signs behind us. There was no table to which we were invited anywhere else, and we were in the middle of the year with an idea of the distance ahead of us. Some of us would sleep, some of us would walk as we slept. Thank you. Good morning. Such beauty today. I want to say uh, and begin with, with gratitude um, for Simone Lee um, for gathering, gathering us, gathering us here. And I also want to express gratitude to Rashida, Saidia, Tina, and the extraordinary number of people who have brought us all here today. Um, for Vanessa, for Deborah, for Kanisa, I'm bringing it home. <laughs> All right, let's get this started. Could I have the first slide, please? And I can have the next slide. Simone Lee's exquisite figures of blackness, black womanhood, black femme, fired in ceramics and stoneware, cast in bronze, wrapped in raffia, unfold counter-cartographies against the gridded orthographics that designed the West monuments to capitalism, colonialism, and racial domination. Inspired by sovereignty, I want to share with you a reflection on the materiality and monumentality of the European arts of building. That is architecture and its monuments. I want to test the limits, the edges of the forms and gestures of commemoration for what cannot be remembered and for whom we cannot know. Can we construct, as Catherine McKitchen imagines, a quote, totally different system of geographic knowledge that cannot replicate subordination precisely because it is born of and holds on to the unknowable. First name, last name. Unknown, unknown. Our design team had been tasked to create a memorial to remember a community of enslaved men, women, and children who built and maintained the University of Virginia, whose academical village was designed by a signer of the Declaration of Independence, the second governor of Virginia, the third president of the US, lawyer, surveyor, plantation owner, rapist, and owner of 600 enslaved people on several plantations over the course of his life. Numerous archives contain records of his thoughts, his movements, and desires, at least some of them. We even know that on Monday, July 31st, 1809, he feasted on a breakfast of, quote, tea, coffee, excellent muffins, hot wheat, cornbread, cold ham, and butter, end quote. No doubt prepared by the black women who survived that he held in bondage. And while his bronze visage, cast as standing or sitting, has been placed in several locations around UVA, in front of the journalism school at my own institution, and in a pantheon-like classical memorial in the National Mall in Washington, D.C., we know nothing about the estimated 4,000 peoples who labored to build and maintain the storied academical village dedicated to the education of future statesmen, doctors, historians, and lawyers of the fledgling liberal democracy. His designs for UVA, UVA constructed a, quote, intimate affiliation of liberty and bondage, as Saidiya Hartman writes in Scenes of Subjection. His use of what we call in architecture, the architectural section, sustained the well-being, concealed the views of kitchens, workyards, 
in long rooms where black bodies labored to sustain the well-being of white administrators, professors, students, fathers, mothers, and children within the Arcadian neoclassical grounds whose rotunda housed the Library of Western Enlightenment. And yet, those same archives of slavery had yielded very little knowledge about those 4,000 people whose lives we've been tasked to remember. The only extant testament of their experiences was recorded in a letter by Isabella Gibbons, who risked her life to teach herself and her husband to read and write, and who had been a cook owned by several white professors living in Pavilion 5. This is what she remembered of enslavement, quote, can we forget the crack of the whip, cowhide, whipping post, the auction block, the handcuffs, the spaniels, the iron collar, the Negro trader tearing the young child from its mother's breast as a whelp from the lioness? Have we forgotten that by these horrible cruelties, hundreds of our race have been killed? No, we have not or ever will." End quote. So in October, 2016, before we committed ideas to paper, so to speak, we worked with local institutions to host public forums where people shared their aspirations, desired meanings, questions of even the visibility of the memorial, and the relevance of it to the current moment. Many still referred to the university as the plantation, precisely because its enclosures and extractive not logics, slavery's afterlife, persisted in the low wages for university employment and the high rents and displacements from black neighborhoods encroached on by wealthier students, in the city's segregated school system, and in the policing of black residents, especially in areas on or near the historic grounds. At our meetings in church basements and community centers, one consistent request we heard was that the memorial had to be truthful to have legitimacy. Another was that we had to express dualities, not only their pain and suffering, but also their dignity, resilience, and humanity. It was deemed vital that the memorial name names of those whose lives had been erased, not only from UVA's grounds, but also from history. Now in early renderings prior, uh, of the project prior to archival study, we had imagined that the names would appear in vertical, vertical columns on the memorial's granite surface. Eventually working in collaborations with historians studying slavery at the university, the archives yielded the following examples. 1820, Rhoda, unknown. UVA rents, quote, Negro named Rhoda, end quote, from an estate for eight, uh, in 1820 for $20. X writes, quote, I'm truly sorry for Rhoda's illness and, and am afraid that this, by this she must be dead. Her son Winston comes to see what has become of her, if she is alive. I will thank you to inform him of the state of her case, end quote. 1825, black woman, unknown, Letter commenting on the death of, quote, one of Mr. X's black women from typhoid fever. 1836, unknown, unknown, a woman. 1843, Harriet, unknown. X to X mentions enslaved woman Harriet, who was, quote, troublesome, is now rented out for $10 in the country. In our ledger, a digital spreadsheet, these 311 unknown unknowns were denoted as blacks, colored ladies, four Negroes, servants, runaway, and two hands. We recorded a handful of people like Isabella Gibbons with first and last names, and another 577 people with first name only, last name unknown. In total of the estimated 4,000 people, 3,111 remained unknown, unknown. Organized on our spreadsheet by date, first name, last name, and in historic details, we learned this from the work ledgers of white bookkeepers, supervisors, and slave owners, from the letters penned by white students, professors, and wives, and from the wills listing estate property. The list became a technique of modern bureaucratic documentation seen on monuments, 
Remembering, for example, the victims of genocide or honoring fallen soldiers like the two plaques dedicated to Confederate traitors that protesters at UVA had demanded that the university remove from the south entrance of the rotunda after the deadly white supremacist march in August of 2017. Could I have the next slide, please? So how could we not avoid the archival resonances of Gibbon's horrible cruelties by retaining the list as a form of remembrance common to the Western monument. What if we refused legibility? As much as we were tasked to name names, could I have the next please? As much as we were tasked to name names, we recognized that names for most could not be traced, that the relationships were obscured, that historical knowledge was occluded. Across the arc of the granite memorial, of the granite for the memorial to enslaved laborers, we created a genealogical cloud by arraying the known and unknown names. For those for whom the archive recorded a presence but no name, like, quote, one of Mr. X's black women, end quote, we substituted kinship relations and occupations. Jack, Isabella Gibbons, and unknown unknown became grandmothers, sisters, and friends. They also became bell ringers, woodcutters, janitors, laundresses. For the entire community, over its 48 years of its existence, we also placed 4,000 memory marks. Each gash recalls the labor of the stonemasons, the mark of the whip, but also the beauty of scarification. Each memory mark holds the possibility of naming an ancestor. One year after the memorial's completion in 2020, for example, five members of Thrimston Hearn's community, family, were added. But each memory mark also holds the impossibility of naming, holding on to McKittrick's tricks unknowable. And what we didn't know was that a memory mark also formed a vessel holding water that drips down from the memorial's granite surface, a tear, after a heavy rain. Perhaps rather than made evident, be made evident through the scant, violent details of the archival ledger, letter, or will, the rich, complex lies of this community unfolds in part in the ephemeral, haptic mark-making throughout the memorial, as well as in the imagination of descendants and visitors as a multiplicity of future memories not yet known. Thank you. Greetings. My name is Ming Washington. I'm a 2022 graduate of the AUC Art Collective for the Study of Art History and Curatorial <laughs> Studies at Spelman College. I am currently based in LA as a curatorial assistant, poet, and, community, and communication strategist. I am honored to briefly introduce the next hour of presenters for Loophole of Retreat, Venice. Zara Julius is an interdisciplinary social practice artist, researcher, and vinyl selector based in Johannesburg, South Africa. She is also founder of Pan-African Creative Research and Cultural Storytelling Agency, Conjo. Rizvana Bradley is assistant professor of film and media studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Her forthcoming monograph, Anti-Aesthetics, Black Aesthetics and the Critique of Form, is a recipient of the Creative Capital Andy Warhol, Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant. Nagara Kudumu is an interlocutor working at the intersection of art and healing with a focus on contemporary art from the Pacific Northwest, Africa, South Asia, and the respective diasporas. She focuses on client-facing work as a curator independent scholar, coach, teacher, content producer, and healer. Lastly, Janaya Oliveira is a film scholar and independent curator, professor at the Federal Institute of Rio de Janeiro. Oliveira has a PhD in history. She is the founder of the Black Cinema 
itinerant forum and was the Flaherty Film Seminar Programmer for 2021. Please enjoy. Good morning. It's an honor to be here. Um, and it's with gratitude to my past project participants that I share this presentation. For the past few years, I've been thinking through what folks might call the black radical tradition and trying to dislocate it from the presupposition that blackness with a capital B begins at the moment of transatlantic slavery and rather situated on the African continent, centering blackness in the global south more broadly instead of allowing our experiences as Africans to be a footnote in what I believe to be an incredibly useful, though somewhat incomplete, analytical framework. In placing the black radical tradition in conversation with spiritual rapture in my work, I've been asking how we might take seriously black cultural innovation and performativity on the African continent in context of enduring settler, colonial logics, and landlessness. This is a project that has taken many forms, with Vusi Yende filmed at the site where I did a durational performance in 2020. I met Uncle Vusi at a jazz listening session that has been running in Kwatema for over 20 years with a, jazz, with a group of jazz uncles, including renowned printmaker Sam Nshengetwa. Kwatema is a black township that, that was established in 1951, when black folk were forcibly removed from Painville. There are a few viral cell phone videos of Uncle Vusi dancing in taverns that generate a kind of feedback loop with this work. And the moment that may seem like an individual reaching for elsewhere alone is actually engaged in simultaneous ensembles and echoes for those with a knowing and participation. A reaching, a refusal of individuation, and a questioning of the distinction between the audience, the ensemble, and the performer. Recently, I've been returning to my first significant project and connecting the dots to what brought me here, the placing of spiritual rapture, this moment of ascension, in conversation with what I now know is a black radical tradition. And so I've been applying my current ways of working and thinking onto that initial material eight years later. And it's these reflections and fragments of a found footage archive I've been developing that I'm sharing with you today. In 2014, I embarked on my first significant period of fieldwork when I still believed critical anthropology was possible. <laughs> At its first instance, the project thought through the worship localities and spiritual mobilities in Johannesburg's inner city. My research was with South African and Zimbabwean congregants of local, syncretic, African-initiated, Pentecostal-type churches, namely Amazayoni and Amanazareta. The appropriate, that appropriate and reconstitute public space into sacred space through their communing for church services throughout the city, in parks, train stations, school classrooms, opposite firearm shops, against the walls of decommissioned synagogues, at the foothills of the mine dumps that bore the city of gold, and underneath the highway overpasses that echo the city's expansion. Informed by Michelle de Soto, I commuted to and through the city with congregants in the blues, greens, and whites of Zioni and Nazareta church uniforms, and then also walked these routes of worship on other days of the week. The project asked broadly what it might mean to walk through a modernist city constituted by the strategies and violence of apartheid spatial planning, the colonial imperative of racialized labor migration, and the enduring conditions of black landlessness consequent to settler logics. Whilst concerned with the matters of spiritual formation and how enraptured modes of walking may rupture the post-apartheid logics of city being, if only momentarily, the project centralized the types of irreducible hauntings and subversions that linger in and animate a city like Johannesburg and the land it rests on. Unearthed into gold mine dumps that simultaneously poison their citizenry with radioactive uranium dust and provides safe havens for both remarkable scenes of worship and harrowing scenes of gender-based violence alike, where just two months ago, eight women were gang-raped by alleged illegal miners at an abandoned mine dump on the east of the city. 
the land on which Johannesburg embeds itself, necessitates that we not just walk the city, but also listen to the sonic palimpsest and lines of repetition and desire that it offers us. And more importantly, take seriously the emotional work this listening and sounding demands of us, where affect, joy, and conflict become far more useful and indeed productive ways of knowing and tending to not just the social gathering, but also the land. Listening is ephemeral and unquantifiable. It predisposes a vulnerability in the listener, a posture of being agape that undoes the castle imperative from which borders have demarcated the Bantustan, the nation state and their hauntings. In engaging imperial space time as a stratagem of empire, listening takes the dust seriously and pays attention to how sonics undo impose conceptions of both time and knowing. I was not raised religious, but I grew up listening to the hymns of both Amazayoni and ZCC, sung by the various women who cared for me. I would go into their rooms and listen to them sing whilst they did the ironing. Their church uniforms would hang above the bed like an enshrined artwork of possibility, purposefully separated from the wardrobe which housed clothes drenched in labor and the mundane. It is precisely this reality of labor that informed the creation of the Um Nazareta and the Shembe church uniform, where their first prophet, Isaiah Shembe, a Zulu-born Pentecostal evangelist, attempted to create the symbol of Zulu hegemony in black migrant labor force of colonial South Africa that reduced black citizens to units of labor and their ethnic identity. Shembe congregants were trained to be exemplary Zulu workers, explicitly depicted in male worship attire. In addition to the traditional isinene and ibeshu, made from gennet tails and cattle hide, Shembe men customarily wear a collared shirt, tie, and sweater vest and carry a briefcase on their journeys to and from church, symbols of their both professionalism and their commitment to tradition. Labor and the ascension beyond it are co-implicated. The communal rapture is subversively complicit. It is informed both through and despite labor and landlessness. One day during my field work, I was speaking to one of my project participants, Samson. Samson strongly identifies as a Zulu migrant laborer from rural Kizuri Natal and belongs to the Church of Shembe or Ama Nazareta. During a con conversation and over the park outside the train station, the head bishop began the call, Ison Tweni. Ison Tweni means both church, means both at church and to church. The bishop makes this call like an Adan calling worshippers to remove their shoes and prepare for the service every Saturday. The bishop called again, Son Tweni. His voice reverberating through the brick park, Samson stopped midway through our conversation and said, we better go, the angels are coming now. You know, he's not just calling us to church, he's also calling the angels down from heaven to join us. His eyes were leaking joy. And they come, it's not just that we believe, no, they actually come, they are here with us.
After the final service each Sabbath, congregants hold a mukiri, a sonic and performative communion for the ancestral grounding of the collective. Different sonically to Mkidi held by Izangoma that centers the feverish, persistent polyrhythmic beatings of drums, or perhaps the gatherings of traditional dances in Johannesburg's mining labor hostels. Mkidi Woma Nazareta is similarly hypnotic, but it is distinctively slow and measured. Drums beat in unison, emphasizing the rhythmic and deliberate planting of congregants' bare feet on the ground as they move together. The impact on both the ground and the drum is something to hold onto amongst the repetitive, polyrhythmic, antiphonal, atonal blowing of Mbomu. Long metal horns which were originally introduced to the church in 1910 by their first prophet. I'm interested in these moments of communal ascension, the inability to individuate the performer from the ensemble, the audience from the ensemble, and lastly the city, land and dust from this thing we call spirit. Rapture, like mahunaj, is indeed freedom, and indeed freedom are verbs in the continuous tense, not nouns. Mkiri is a technology for going elsewhere and returning, for punctuating and remembering the networks of angels of worship, death, labor, loss, and life, of joy. It fills you up and empties you out. It breaks your heart and mends it at once. Black waveforms, a simultaneity of space and time, beats, rhythms, notational moods, and frequencies that encompass listening to and sounding black life emerge as sites of possibility for both the living and the living dead in the face of black labor unit status and the anti-black practices assigned to, as Catherine McKittrick writes, break black into absolute negation. Listening and sounding advocate for a continuous movement and circulation of the gift of spirit through the echo. What does it mean to center the internal workings of black sonics and our understandings of ourselves as black people, and also the land on which we and our living dead have been made wanderers? Thank you. Good morning. First, I want to express my deepest gratitude to everyone who has worked to organize this historic gathering, Rashida Bambre, Saidia Hartman, Tina Kempt, and of course, Simone Lee. I also want to give thanks to all of the black women, including generations past, whose everyday life and labors continue to sustain the intellectual, artistic, and political flourishing of black feminist practice in all of its multiplicity. Awaiting her verb. In a speculative piece entitled, The End of White Supremacy in American Romance, Saidia Hartman provocatively suggests that extinction could very well be the only thing that could, quote, bridge the gulf between the sovereign and the fungible, end quote. Indeed, perhaps blackness could always have been said to signal the unraveling or flailing of the project of enclosure, which authorizes itself under the banner of sovereignty. For blackness is precisely an ongoing eruption of the imminently unsovereign, which the state and its analogs work obsessively to malign and repress, even at their own expense. The limits to and spuriousness of sovereignty's pretensions, whether figured in the nation state, the empire, the settler colony, or the individuated subject, 
are disclosed everywhere and all the time by black traditions whose variegated practices of gathering, of attention, and mutual aid, however circumscribed, tend toward the impossible artistry of shared preservation. Our beleaguered breath, which is ceaselessly made to come before the asphyxiations of the world, but which we nevertheless hold and are held by in this reverend togetherness. A body horizontal, recumbent, but not prone. A body laid low, passive, but not submissive. The incomplete view of this body, half buried, at once tremulous and recessive, suggests that this apparently compliant, tractable, unprotesting body is not entirely abject. The image signifies upon the intangible allure of the turned back made so famous by William Hogarth's 18th century theory of the body's sensuous contours, a figural motif that solidified the indelible iconicity of the white female body's line of beauty. This now infamous line, exemplified by the nudes of artists such as Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres, became essential to the representation of the modern body and variously extended through 19th and 20th century vocabularies of abstraction in works by a range of artists of disparate aesthetic persuasions, including Paul Cezanne, Joseph Albers, John Cage, Cindy Sherman, and Kiki Smith. But where 20th century artists subjected the serpentine line to a series of strategically improvisational abstractions, and contemporary feminist artists critically subverted the integrity of its representational motifs, Black feminist retracings of this line express a crucial difference. Undercutting the putative autonomy of the work of art, these retracings follow from a prior inscription that is also an excription from the unfolding of a vernacular tradition by which black radical praxis is marked and remarked. This is a tradition that belies the conceit that the work of art is the product of the isolated genius or the mastery of an inv individual creator. Attending to this irreducible difference requires attuning to the political and aesthetic divergences and deviations that are this tradition's inheritance and bequeathment, its gift and burden. The sense of being made a body that must bear the impossibility of a world which requires the reproduction and reproductive labor of one's body, even as it forecloses upon that body's very existence. If the viewer is troubled by the obscurity of this body's origin, it is because the body of the black has lost its head, and with it perhaps its raison d'etre. What would be the radiating center of subjectivity for the resting model has been effaced. If this figure is one who, in Franz Fanon's idiom, is predestined to wait, if this figure could be said to be waiting, it is not for the conferral of external recognition not for the imminent canonization of black form. This is not a body that awaits being written into Western art history and its lexicon of beauty. Rather, this figure retreats even as it repeats. It at once bears and slips from the impositions of form, the imperatives of canonization, and the injunctions of representation. Our work understands that the existential drama of blackness is cleaved to and by the racial matterings of gender. In the words of Hortense Spillers, here is a figure, quote, unvoiced, misseen, not doing, awaiting her verb, end quote. How do we track the gender declension between Fanon's waiting and Spillers's awaiting? Paradoxically, perhaps, contemporary black artists sign through a dispersed history of artful refusals through black radical traditions animated as much by impossible dreams and wayward longings as by a politics endlessly deferred. And yet the shadow of a doubt, are we the ones we've been waiting for? Black performance draws us into an impossible conjunction the unbearable simultaneity that can be said to pervade black life and embodiment of a weighted existence and a lightness of being that was never meant to be. 
black performance unfolds through a mode of enfleshment whose essential breathwork exposes an onto-epistemological entanglement and rupture, an enfleshment which exposes a conceptual impasse between what Fan Franz Fanon famously avowed as the black's relentless and irredeemable fall into, quote, an utterly naked declivity, end quote, and the black countergravity Tina Camp has theorized as that which, quote, defies the physics of anti-blackness that has historically exerted a negating force aimed at expunging black life, end quote. Black performance bodies forth an aporia that holds us in suspense. Since the mid-19th century, as Ariella Azule describes it, the camera shutter has opened and closed the jaws of history. What can be rendered legible by the photograph comes to index the shape, boundaries, and directives of the political. Photography is deployed to ensure that the social, the political, is everywhere and all the time understood as that which can be rendered visible. The photograph is imagined simply as visual evidence of what must be made present, its universal accessibility and intelligibility presumed as ontological fact and ethical right. But those of us who have always lived within the dark corners of the photograph must constantly remind ourselves that the concealments, interdictions, expulsions, and contortions of the aesthetic are neither incidental nor secondary to the exigencies perpetually figured as present. Can the black body or the subject it is thought to index be pictured? Does photography prefer the reflection that the mirror stage would deny us? This war unfolding beneath the facade of the visual requires us to reflect upon representation as constituted by more than what is presumed to comprise an image. As Stuart Hall has argued, quote, representation works as much through what is not shown as through what is, end quote. Once we begin to re recognize the forces of racial counterinsurgency undergirding the composition of the visible, we may begin to pay attention not simply to what the photographs visualize, but to the racial metaphysics by which they direct us to see, that which creates the conditions for what appears as well as for what is concealed. Photography alerts us to a kind of Benjaminian optical unconscious in which the ceaseless metaphysical annihilation of blackness constitutes what is visualizable through the perceptual displacement of the minor, errant repertoires of black existence. Photographic visuality, in other words, cannot be disentangled from the foundationally anti-black metaphysics of the modern world. The colonial and imperial habits of photographic worlding require the myth of origin as much as destiny. A narrational reflex painfully undone in Saidiya Hartman's Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Route. Hartman and Hartman's encounters with the archive reveal that there is more at stake than an ethical, political, or epistemic failure of photographic representation. To be clear, the problem is not with photographic representation per se. The issue that ought to concern us is rather the phantasmatic production of the something represented, or more precisely, how this something represented is made to appear as if it has emerged from the inconceivable horrors of the unrepresentable. Quote, the hell holes of the most horrific conditions imaginable, end quote. For Hartman, the violations of history are folded into the extant yearnings of and for those gone and forgotten, those continuously absented from the archive, yearnings which cannot find a resting place in this world. Absence in this context can only be rendered ancillary to some presumed prior presence. There are a host of disorderly subjects, practices, relations, affections, and passions that cannot be captured by the, photograph's medium, by the photographic medium's indexical iconic function, and which are therefore cast outside of historical memory. Any critical evaluation of the photographic medium's role in materializing race, or more precisely in fabricating the singular raciality blackness is made to bear, must contend with the way ph photography's spatial and temporal logics have been structured by a metaphysics whose aesthetic regime of picturing depends upon the production of violent gaps, omissions, contortions, and eradications. That much is clear, but what is cast out of the frame is never altogether excised. 
What happens to an image when it encounters the trace of what Catherine McKittrick refers to as black absent present, absented presences? That which, quote, cannot be seen or heard or read, but is always there, end quote. How then do we attend to this visual surplus, a desire or suffering excessive to the image, as bound to that which cannot be pictured? Can we picture our missing reflection? Can we find it in a new image of the body, a new image of sovereignty, of politics? Or perhaps every effort to return us to picturing returns us to the merciless directives of the racial metaphysics of presence. Perhaps we need, instead, to cultivate a kind of attention which embraces the declivitous underside that undercuts every enterprise of world picturing, the wounding that refuses suture. To linger within this tear in the world in Dion Brand's poetics is to re reinvent what it means to see. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nagara Akili Kadumu. My work lies at the intersection of art and healing. I am a spiritualist involved in several African diasporic spiritual traditions, namely African American conjure and Afro Cuban Palo Monte. I am also a curator and a, writer, and a writer who keeps company with artists and scholars who think about their practices as long-term acts of, of self-regard with a view towards liberation. My current working definition of liberation is informed by Toni Morrison who said that the function the function of freedom is to free someone else, and that freedom is ultimate, ultimately about being able to choose one's responsibility. And I would also add to that to whom one will be responsible. My definition is also informed by the spiritual practices to which I adhere, which value vitality, prioritize healing, and that provide me the tools to support myself and others in the constant pursuit of liberation. My thinking on liberation starts with self-regard and the way it catalyzes the love for self that makes liberation possible. Liberation in my observation and in my experience cannot be achieved without love. It also cannot be achieved without the help of others. I am reminded here of the line in Beloved that says, she is a friend. <laughs> she is a friend of my mind. She gather me, man. The pieces I am, she gather them and give them back to me all in the right order. <laughs> This quote adeptly describes one of the most unadulterated forms of love and kinship that people can express for each other. This is what I have received from my mother and grandmother. This is, this is what I have been extraordinarily fortunate to receive from my friends, notably Cotty and Barrett, who are here today. This is what... This is what Simone Le and Rashida Bumbray 
have done for us all with loophole and sovereignty. This quote is also a simplified explanation of the goal of the initiatory rights of many African diasporic spiritual traditions that take the unhealed through complex, time-intensive processes, time processes, put them back in the right order and on the right path. That said, in the remaining time, I will share a brief history of St. Anthony, Kempavita, and their legacies in the African diaspora, thank you, Tina, African diaspora of the Americas, and to share my in-progress thinking about why Toni Morrison merits heavy consideration in any discussion on liberation. St. Anthony of Padua is a Catholic saint of Italian origin that found his way to the Kingdom of Congo due to the presence of Italian Capuchin missionaries. St. Anthony is the patron saint of lost things, people, and even spiritual items. He is the patron saint of Lisbon and many places in Portugal, as well as the former Portuguese colonies. His veneration is important to note here in light of the significant populations of Africans from West Central Africa who were forcibly removed from their lands and brought to the African diaspora of the Americas. Catholic or not, Anthony's presence amongst people of African descent and the diaspora of the Americas left such an indelible mark in the collective subconscious and is evidenced by the immense number of African descendant individuals throughout the African diaspora of the Americas who are named some derivation of the name Anthony. Please raise your hand if you are either related to or grew up with individuals named Anthony, Antonia, Antoine, Antoinette. Okay. I'd also like to mention one of the most famous Anthonys is our much beloved Toni Morrison, but more on her shortly. Kempavita, also known as Dona Beatriz, was a Congolese prophetess who in 1704, at the age of 20, became the leader of a movement to put an end to various civil wars amongst diverse factions of the kingdom's nobility who were vying for power. The political situation was ripe for exploitation by various factions and contributed to the growth of the Atlantic slave trade. Kempavita was initiated into a religious society called Kempasi. The Kempasi society's primary goal was to identify, eradicate, and heal the wounds of any suffering levied at the community. When a problem was identified, a group of initiated practitioners would come together to organize healing work to resolve the issue. This society also organized the initiation of new practitioners who upon initiation were thought to no longer be the people they were previously, and from that point on were endowed with new abilities and were oftentimes exempt from previous social restrictions. The relationship to Catholicism for citizens of the Kingdom of Congo was quite different from the colonial realities in other parts of the African continent. Catholicism was understood and received by the Congolese elite and nobility as a powerful socio-political tool, so much so that many of the elite willingly converted. Catholic schools taught by Congolese people were established to educate the young. Amongst the practitioners of the indigenous traditions of the kingdom, Catholic saints were viewed as the spirits of individuals who did incredible things during their life and now dead could continue to do incredible things when worked by knowledgeable spiritual practitioners. This understanding was synonymous with indigenous understandings of similar kinds of spirits called Inkita. As such, it is not a stretch to consider the respect that a saint such as Anthony commanded and why the movement led by Kempavita invoked his name. It is important to note that the legacies of the Kimpasi society can be found in many places and spiritual traditions throughout the diaspora, namely in Afro-Cuban Palo Monte and Espiritismo Cruzado, African-American Conjure, Haitian Vodou, the Black Spiritualist Church, and also the Kojic Church. What all of these healing traditions have in common is technology for this liberation of the spirit and by extension of the mind and body, a focus on vitality and by extension a minimization of suffering. They also have in common, whether acknowledged or not, the centrality of women to the successful realization of the parallel processes of healing and liberation within black communities. These archetypes have been exemplified by women such as Cecile Fatima of Haiti, Mother Leafy Anderson and Catherine Seals of the Black Spiritualist Church, Aunt Caroline Dye, Na Secundina and Na Filomena of Cuba, Queen Nanny of the Maroons, the women of the Dismal Swamp Maroons, 
Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, and Toni Morrison of Lorain, Ohio. In 1704, Kempavita fell ill and was thought to be nearing death. For seven days, she suffered immensely with fever and hallucinations. All of a sudden, her condition began to calm and she had a vision of a Capuchin monk. In the vision, this man, who she identifies as St. Anthony, speaks to her saying that God sent him to her to deliver a message to the people of the Kingdom of Congo. He told her that the restoration of the Kingdom of Congo was her primary focus and explained that anyone who threatened her would be severely punished by God. He then went on to explain that he had attempted in earnest to relay this message to others in three other cities, but they all ignored him. Now Kempavita was the chosen one. In this moment, Kempavita was charged with the task of, of, of healing the Kingdom of Congo. Through spiritual intervention, she moved from a disordered state to a reordered state. From then on, the movement took root, and Kempavita moved throughout her kingdom as the embodiment of St. Anthony, preaching a ministry that affirmed and uplifted the indigenous spiritual practices of the citizens of Congo, and which denounced the injustice heaped upon the Congolese citizenry by both the colonial presence and infighting amongst various factions of the Congolese elite. At a certain point, nearly 80,000 individuals are purported to have converted to this Antonian doctrine. In 1943, at the age of 12, Chloe Wolford converted to Catholicism and took St. Anthony of Padua as her confirmation name. The name was later shortened to Tony, and the world would know this incredible individual as Tony Morrison. Morrison extends the legacy of Kempavita's Antonian ministry and its diverse diasporic legacies through a career dedicated to writing abjectly beautiful stories about African American people. In these stories, we were both her subject and her primary audience. When questioned about her commitment to us, she was unwavering and doubled down further to reinforce her position. She encouraged us to be clear on our mission and to, and to not let anyone distract us or waste our time. Like many of the women I have already named, and certainly like Kempavita and her Antonian ministry, Toni Morrison had an acute sense of the realities of the world she lived in. She had conducted all the research. She needed more than just data and information. She needed imagination. It is useful here to consider imagination as a lay terminology for what we spiritualists refer to as seeing, clairvoyance, or spiritual sight. The ability to see or imagine creates possibility for action. When there is possibility, you can make a plan. You become legible to yourself and by extension to those like you who share your lived experience. In the case of Nasekundina in Cuba, you can bring the dead back to life. Or in Cecil Fatiman's case, kick off the Haitian revolution that set the example for subsequent liberatory movements across the Caribbean and other parts of the diaspora or in Fannie Lou Hamer's case, advocate for voting rights for black people in the state of Mississippi, Mississippi and inaugurating the Freedom Farm Collective. Toni Morrison states in her essay, Rememory, in her book, The Source of Self-Regard, but writing is not simply recollecting or reminiscing or even epiphany. It is doing, creating a narrative infused, in my case, with legitimate and authentic characteristics of the culture. This is an important point, especially in the contemporary moment, because so often discussions of liberation do not move past the discursive. History shows us that liberation in all its iterations, interior, intimate, or public, have always been about ongoing deeds whose results are eventually observable. I'm not convinced that our self-regard can be activated or enlivened if we have not put, into practice, put it into practice in the world. To that end, Toni Morrison remains important in these discussions because she did not just speak empty words. She was, to paraphrase Little Richard when speaking of Jimi Hendrix, our star. She poured her words potent with the love she had for black people and black life into the dipper and poured them back down onto the, onto the world, us. In closing, I am going to share with you the caption of an Instagram post I wrote on October 15th, 2020, the day after we learned that Simone was going to be the US representative for the Biennale. <laughs> 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 
Yesterday, it was announced that Simone Lee would be the first black woman artist to represent the United States at the forthcoming 2022 Venice Biennale. I am elated, of course, but not for the obvious reasons. I first saw Lee's work in May of last year at the Guggenheim, the magnitude of which is still sinking in. By August, Toni Morrison had died. Morrison's death got me thinking about the dearth of individuals in the world who truly love black people, specifically black women. Morrison's death meant one less person physically in the world who loved us so fiercely. The pain of that loss ran especially deep because Morrison was mighty and prophetic with and in her love for us. Let's get this page together. I lamented this out loud with our dear friend Rashida as I mourned Morrison. I see in Lee's work the love and commitment Morrison gave us generously and consistently through her novels and public discourse. It is honest, it is steadfast, it is not conditioned on anything other than our, exist our existence. The important of Lee's work for me is that she prioritizes the creation and maintenance of spaces within which black women are center. The, this, the discourse is not just about us, it is for us and by us. This is, a very, this is a very big deal in a world that seeks our demise. Dare I say it, this is liberation work. Congratulations, Simone Lee, but more importantly, thank you for keeping us in the center in word and in deed. Thank you. Bom dia. Wow. Just a second. I need some water. Oh, Negara, I was not ready for that. <laughs> so let's let's start. When we speak, it's subjective. When they speak, it's neutral. When we speak, it's personal. When they speak, it's rational. When we speak, it's emotional. When they speak, it's impartial. When we speak, it's partial. They have So um, this is Anna P. She's a dancer and filmmaker, and she is quoting parts of Grada Quilombo's Plantation's Memories, as you might have recognized. I cut the clip, but she ends up by saying that we are not dealing uh, here with a peaceful coexistence of words, but, ra but rather, uh, sorry, rather with a violent hierarchy which defines who can speak and what we can speak about. I will add that this is a violent hierarchy who also defines what is cinema, what is film culture, uh, who can film, and who can curate films too, and so on. Thank you. I'm Janaina Oliveira. I'm a film curator and scholar born, raised, and based in the chaotic and beautiful city of Rio de Janeiro. 
I'm not sure if you're aware, but Rio is a kind of political laboratory of everything that happens to be the worst that happens nowadays in Brazil, except for me. <laughs> and, but this is about to end because Lula is going to win. And, and all my colleagues, uh, as all my colleagues here, I have no words to express how grateful I am to be here. Thanks, Rashida. Thanks, Simone. Thanks, Tina, Sadir, the whole team behind Susan, Daphne, Emily, Greta, and all the others involved in making this magic happen. Uh, thank you also for this creation. I'm so moved to be, you know, paired with those amazing women. That's so I decided to start this brief presentation with an appease video for two reasons. The first one is because my curatorial practice is intrinsically motivated by a desire towards something I call epistemological displacements. Not only displacements for, from the film canon, but also I'm thinking about epistemology in a broader sense. I'm thinking about the way and how we feel and live with moving images. For me, epistemological displacements are present in Grada Quilomba's work, as in the work of many incredible women that are here with us, and who are also my reference, that also make this moment a kind of nightmare, a good nightmare, <laughs> but a nightmare. I've been pretending normality since yesterday, but I'm pretending. Uh, but it's also present, this idea of epistemological displacement in a pretty provocative gesture that's available on YouTube and you can see it. Uh, at the very end, I'm interested in ways of mobilizing other forms and notions to think, create, and program films, making possible to live with cinema and not in spite of it, to stop resisting images when we attend to film festivals and other spaces safe like this one. That's, um, for example, what I did when I used Edouard Glissant's idea of opacity as a prompt for the flight film seminar that I programmed last year. Uh, I won't expand much on this, but uh, Denise Ferreira da Silva, that is going to speak later, I think tomorrow, was one of the feature artists and Tina Camp and gave us the honor to do in the opening with an amazing key, anti keynote follow it via conversation with Sadia Hartman. So there's more information about this at the uh, Flight Film Seminar uh, website. There's also a beautiful catalog available in Portuguese and English. Uh, but I consider at first when I was invited to speak about this program connecting in relation to the idea of marronage. But then I moved forward trying to bring, uh, you know, things that connect, connected me more uh, straightly part with works, Simone's work. Um, so that bring, brings me to the second reason I uh, start with Anna P. He made a short film, she made a short film called Noir Blue in 2018. And that was a fundamental film for another curatorial proposal developed in 2019, this time for Rotterdam International Film Festival, when I was invited to put together a program about black Brazilian cinema in dialogue with the work with Sozi Mububu, of Sozi Mububu, considered a pi the pioneer of black Brazilian cinema. For me, as usual, the, the challenge was to put together a program that would not return once and again to the usual unexpected tropes and narratives that we talk about when we uh, um, think about black experience in cinema. It was a kind of long program with four feature films and a, a group of fi five groups of shorts. And one of them, especially, was formed uh, with films directed by black women in which we could see a unique, uh, we can see unique ways of thinking about the experience of the diaspora and by extension, the relationship with the African continent. The program was called Fluxus and Reconnections. Uh, perspectives of African diaspora cinema, retracing and updating the historical ties with the continent and resignifying African descent. Along with these fluxes and reconnections, 
um, where perceptions and definitions of the diaspora were updated, those filmmakers were presenting another ways of thinking about themselves, their histories, and their ancestors. And that's why I connect, it connected me directly with the dimensions of sovereignty and the work with Simone in general. And that's why I'm sharing a few clips with you because I'm a film person and you, know, you need to see things. <laughs> So those are the films and with the frames, let's go to them. I hope it's é importante good. saber que o que eu estou vivendo agora é o futuro que alguém sonhou para mim há muito tempo atrás. E é por isso que eu peço a bênção dessas pessoas mais velhas. Fala, Yorubá. There's a little delay, I think. Umas pessoas me falavam, ah, você vem da África do Sul. Outras, da Etiópia. Não, você vem do Congo. Não. Você vem de Moçambique. Outras, você vem do Benin. E eu só conseguia pensar assim. Eu venho de todos esses lugares. So, yeah, this is just a small clip for uh, Noir Blue. I forgot, I just, before moving forward, I just want to thank all the artists that have been collaborating with me, Ana P, the collective Mulheres de Pedras, Urania Muzanzo, Aline Mota, Safira Moreira, and Yasmin Tainá for their amazing work and the trust. So, uh, Noah Blue is a travel diary uh, for, of her first trip to Africa, where she went to many countries. She went to Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Ivory Coast, and Mauritania. And I wrote about it for um, that a series edited by Michael Gillespie and Liz Odin, the one, a black one shot. But for me, one of the many amazing things about this film is how she merges time um, in, you know, in a way that she put together past, present, present and futurity while navigating uh, those different territories um, with her dance. Let's take this another one. So this is uh, the first film made by this collective. They are a kind of multidisciplinary collective, um, very connected to healing practices. And um, they uh, did this film, it's a six minute film made in a context that, you know, those kind of contexts, uh, you have 48 hours to make a film in a certain place in a city. The city that, the place in the city that year was, um, a, a place in Rio called Little Africa that's related to, you know, the history of slavery in the town. And that uh, dock that you see in the back, it's called the Empress Dock. And it was the main slave port in Brazil during the 19th century. Uh, historian says that around uh, 500,000 slaves arrived there only uh, in the first half of 19th century. So they are, the film is a kind of performance, a healing performance of those women walking through the city, which connects it pretty much with Sadia's Hartman, the first time I read Minus into Wax. <laughs> and um, yeah, so they are working um, to this collective trauma experience on this film. 
Um, unfortunately, I was really tied to the 12 minute thing, so this, I cut the sound of those clips up. <laughs> So I'll be able to speak. But this film uh, is a beautiful film that itself is a gesture of reconnections because the filmmaker, Rania Muzanzut from Bahia, she brought a group of yellow risha that I don't know how to translate, it's just kind of candomblé priestess, um, to Benin to reconnect with the same tradition there that was a historical fight. So it's so moving how the film itself can be a gesture beyond the cinematic experience. So yes, um, and uh, there's no subtitle, sorry for that. Uh, this other work from Alini Mota, it's called Bridges Over the Abyss, where she's tracing her family roots by uh, her grandmother revelations that her father was uh, a son of a slave owner in the countryside of Rio. So she starts tracing it back and it takes her to Africa. And so she's doing this a kind of three panel film. It was, it was an installation. And I think Aline has this kind of, uh, all her work is related to this kind of pursuit of her ancestrality. Um, last. We have uh, Safira Moreira's Crossroads, Travessia, that brings a reflection about also ancestrality, but questioning the lack of visual memories of for black folks. I'm talking about the Global South experience. If you're born uh, during the 70s or before that, it's gonna be very rare that you have family photos, for example, and she's kind of you know, elaborating on that, reconstructing reconstructing that experience into you know, other photo archives. And that's, we are not listening, but that's her mom's voice talking about her trajectory. So, uh, last but not least, I'm gonna share uh, a clip of a film that was in Rotterdam, and it was really frequent in a series of programs I've made through the years, but was not in the same uh, group of those I just mentioned. I didn't want to stop it. Sorry, I wanted to pause. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so, Cabela, it's a, a short experimental film with 22 minutes made in 2015 by Yasmin Taina. Yasmin Taina is a peripheral filmmaker from Rio that was 19 when she made this short with an equivalent of $800 and uh, a sad, oh, everybody involved, the majority of black women, and it was made in a very collaborative pro process. And what is outstanding about this short is that the, when uh, it premiered, it premiered in the most important uh, film theater in Rio, that by that time there was like 600 places and it was packed both days and the next weekend. This film is fundamental for a young and not so young generation of black Brazilian women, but also cause a great and keep causing a great impact where it's screened abroad. Uh, you can see it on YouTube with English subtitles. Again, I won't have time to develop uh, much about it because my time is over. But I'll end up by saying that in cinema, Listening to the ordinary sound of a natural hair being combed also speaks about sovereignty. 
and that can be revolutionary in the expansion of the film culture possibilities. Obrigada. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> My name is Tanisha Carter Johnson. I'm a third year art history major, curatorial studies and French double minor student at Spelman College. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be amongst you all and it is my honor to briefly introduce the next hour of distinguished presenters for Loophole of Retreat Venice before the midday break. To begin, Christina Sharp is a writer, professor, and Canada Research Chair in Black Studies and Humanities at York University. She is also a senior research associate at the Center for the Study of Race, Gender, and Class at the University of Johannesburg and a research fellow at the Center for Imagination in the Borderlands at the University of Arizona. She is the author of In the Wake on Blackness and Being and Monstrous Intimacies, <laughs> Making Post-Slavery Subjects. Sinam Okudechu is an artist based in Basel, Switzerland, whose internationally exhibited work creates, counter creates counter-narratives of history, theory, and practice across multiple disciplines. She is currently a co-curator for the exhibition Fun Feminism at Kunstmuseum Basel. Mabua Sumahoro is an associate professor at the University of Tours and president of the Black History Month Association dedicated to celebrating black, black history and cultures. She's the author of Black is the Journey, Africana the Name, translated by Dr. Kayama L. Glover. Presented together with Sumahoro is Kayama L. Glover and Whitney Olin, Professor of French and Africana Studies and Faculty Director of the Digital Humanities Center at Bernard College, Columbia University. Her writing includes A Regarded Self, Caribbean Womanhood and the Ethics of Disorderly Being, and Haiti Unbound, a spiralist challenge to the post-colonial canon. Presenters will conclude before our midday break with a performance by Lisa Marie Simmons. Lisa Marie Simmons is a storyteller, singer, songwriter, essayist, and published poet who lives in Lake Garda, Italy. She has performed her critically acclaimed poet, poetic and musical work, Note Speak, internationally, and a follow-up to the project's first album will be released next year. Again, thank you, and enjoy the next group of present presenters. Good afternoon, everyone. What a wonder it is to be gathered by Simone and Rashida and Tina and Saidia here with all of you. My thanks to everyone who makes this happen. All of you, the organizers, the wait staff, the cleaning staff, we are all so grateful. I'm reading from several sections of my forthcoming book, Ordinary Notes. I've changed some of what I'm planning to read for reasons that I hope are apparent. The images will play on a loop just for ease and eventually they'll make sense. My word is manual. Part one, a brief record of facts, thoughts written down as an aid to memory. Note three, quote, the past or more accurately pastness Michel Rothtroyot tells us, is a position. Several years ago, when we were in Erlangen, Germany, R and I went to the Nazi Documentation Center and Nazi Party rally grounds in Nuremberg. By the time we left, after watching the films and viewing the installations, the displays of photographs, books, racist games, and more, we were convinced that depending on where one stood, 
this memorialization would actually attract people to Nazism. The objects function as memorabilia, a memorialization not of the wounded, but of the perpetrator. We observed the other people at the center. Some of their faces were filled with admiration for the brutalities of white nationhood and the heraldic call of white supremacy. They were lit with an emotion that was neither horror at the perpetrators nor sympathy for the victims. The visual and sonic repetitions in the documentation center may now be or may have always been incapable of doing the work of never again that in their installation they were intended to do. We saw in them not the condemnation of the Nazi, but their glorification. These displays enter a present in which, quote, in no way can we identify the past as past, end quote. Part four, to consider or study carefully. Note 98, the black men in the square, Venice, Campo Santa Margherita. June 12th, 2019, 5.53 p.m. It was late afternoon on a hot and humid Venice day. The three of us were walking through the Campo Santa Margherita when we saw him. He was shirtless and kneeling on a raised platform like a pedestal or a cistern. He was wearing only shorts and he was holding something in his mouth. I've called them shorts, but they were more like swim trunks, brown, blousy, and very short, with a string at the waist tied into the bow. In the center of the raised platform that he knelt on was a metal grate, and in his mouth was a partially eaten and browning banana. We were stunned at his appearance there. We stopped and we looked at him, we looked at each other, we were concerned, and we were more than concerned, we were alarmed. The grate he knelt on would have absorbed all of the day's heat, and his knees were unprotected. He was unprotected. We wanted to shield him. We gestured at him. We almost ran toward him. We asked him, are you okay? Is this a protest? We asked him this frantically. We stood there and looked at him until he met and briefly held our eyes. He held our eyes in order to reassure us. He looked so pained. I did not know what this kindness had cost him. He gave us a single, almost imperceptible nod, and then he returned to his concentration. He returned to the discipline and attention of his terrible ritual. I swore afterwards that I had seen him there two years ago, but Dee said no. I tell C that I see him kneeling there on that hot grate. It is, it, it is as if I always see him there. June 12th, 2019, 4.30 p.m. Earlier in the day on Calle Contarina Corfu, we met a man who hailed us. Sister, he said, I am in hell. Note 99, between verticality and the subterranean, quote, you may die a brutal death the brutality being the happenstance, end quote. Five, Lucida. In the context of such enormous structural violence, how was it possible to imagine that a beautiful life is possible? Even more unthinkable was the idea that one might create it, not in the future, but now. Saidiya Hartman, interview with Rizvana Bradley. Note 109. What would a camera lucida of the black maternal look like? What would it trace? What optical device would accurately reveal her hand? In what well-lit room would her texture be revealed? What pane of glass make lucid the reflection? Note 111. These particular photographs are of my mother's face, her hands, her books, her needlework. My camera lucida is saturated with my seeing and my mother's care in the noise of structural precarity. Note 114. It is 1928. In the photograph, my mother is five years old and she is dressed for Halloween. The photographer was her stepfather. It is my mother's hands in the photograph that constitute what Roland Barthes called the punctum, that detail, that accident which pricks me but also bruises me, is poignant to me. Note 115. In the Halloween photograph of my mother and her mother, 
my grandmother has been interrupted. Her husband Joseph has called her away from cleaning or cooking or sewing in order to have their picture taken. She would have told him that she wasn't presentable, that she was busy, that she was wearing her house dress, that her hair was a mess, but he would have persisted, my mother said, calling her by his nickname for her, cajoling her, and my grandmother would relent, step away from her work, and come and sit before his camera. There's a visual echo, some correspondence between my mother's hands, her headdress and wig, the hand-pinked gross grain ribbon that edges the deep V front of her dress, her long beaded necklace, and then the pattern of what look like mended tears in the skirt of her mother's dress. My grandmother sewed the costume that my mother is wearing. There is more than one detail in that photograph that compels and arrests me. There is more than one detail that produces in me a feeling of great tenderness. My mother's hands are one, the holes in my grandmother's dress are another, her shoes another still. Note 139. In a photograph from 1927, my mother sits on the edge of a table. A US flag is planted in her hands. The flag is in focus, but the enormous, beautiful white bow in her hair is blurred, as if there is a part of her all that is always in motion. Part six, preliminary entries toward a dictionary of untranslatable blackness. Note 169, tender. When Claudia Tate interviewed Gail Jones for Black American Literature Forum, she asked, do you have any theories about the human condition which you dramatize in your work? To which Jones replied, I think what comes out in my work in those particular novels, by which she means Corregidora and Eva's Man, is an emphasis on brutality. But I think that something else is also suggested in them, namely the alternative to brutality, which is tenderness. Although the main focus is on the blues relationship or, re or relationships involving brutality, there seems to be a growing understanding working itself out, especially in Corrigadora, of, of what is required in order to be genuinely tender. Perhaps brutality enables one to recognize what tenderness is. The girl who wrote on the chalkboard. The boy who was carrying Skittles and iced tea. The girl who was by herself and surrounded by hate. The young woman who was asleep in her bed. The young woman who drove the wrong way and the baby girl who survived this. The man who cried for his mother. The girl who took the video of the man who cried for his mother. The other girl, the cousin of the first girl, who also witnessed this. The boy who was skipping away. The woman convulsed with mourning and the woman who warned them not to take her picture. The girl who told her mother that she would take care of her. The boy who had only just arrived at the gazebo to play. The girl who was sound asleep in her grandmother's living room. The girl to whose forehead someone taped the word ship the woman who questioned why she was being stopped, the woman pulled over with her three young children in the car, the woman who knocked on a door and asked for help, the boy who was walking down the street, the woman whose two little sons were, slept, were swept away in a flood, the door to their safety barred, the man who was running down the street, the boy who was playing music in his car with his friends. The boy whose mother was anxious when he did not return home. The woman who fell. The girl who called for help. The man who said, I can't breathe. The young man accused of shoplifting and his mother whose heart was broken. The man who said, I'm scared. The sisters, girls, the girls, sisters, whose bones became lessons. The girl who said, I am a child. 
Note 175, tenderness. Tenderness might just be a gesture. It might just be a look, a black look, some regard relayed between people in peril. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Simone, Rashida, I want to say thank you again for bringing this amazing project together. I'm so honored to be here. And um, for those of you who know me, this is going to be very unusual. I'm going to not speak for most of my presentation. Um, instead, I would like to share a project that's very close to my heart that is still unfinished, a film I started work on in 2017 that I created as a project to spend more time with my father in Ghana. Um, and unfortunately, most of the funding for this project came through two weeks after he died. And um, it was based on some of the things that I think Sadia Hartman's book, Lose Your Mother, really brings across. The difficulty of uncovering historical narratives as a woman, as a scholar, as a black woman, um, and some of the obstacles we face. And so this film, is based on my belief that architecture and material culture are able to embody counter narratives of history and that between the generations, how we experience time and space is culturally mediated and that there are shifts in how we experience time and space and memory. And I wanted to use architecture to uncover those shifts but also uncover very important narratives of history that um, are African-centered, African-based and that are in danger of being lost. So I'm going to play this film and let you see it and then maybe talk a little bit about it um, after nine minutes and 30 seconds. And the sound comes late. Then the story is that my ancestor came, the one who came here first, came and saw Secondi Bay. He came from the interior, and as he was coming, when they lived at Kodokrom, the last spot they lived at before they came here, they would hear the roar. And you know that in the past, that without electricity and all of that, sound could travel a long distance. They would hear a roar of an animal, like it was a big animal. And they would say, what is this big animal? So one day, he decided to go out hunting. He made up his mind. He, des he didn't tell anybody. He decided to go out and find this animal. And as he was going, he was breaking things to show the direction he was going. And finally, he came to this place and saw the sea. He couldn't believe that there was such an expanse of water, that the waves would come with fish and leave them on the rocks. And they would be there, and so on. And so he said, and what he, he was seeing was beautiful. And he saw the water that was coming, and the fresh water in the area. And he said, he doesn't care, he's going to build his home here. So he made smoke so that people would come by. And after a few days, those in Kodjokrome, who were wondering what had happened to him, they decided to search for him. And looking at the signs, they came to where he had made fire and stayed. So that's how we moved to the last place. It was here. This site that overlooks the sea. The site that overlooks the sea became the place where the chiefs were. Where the British put the post office. They moved us out, don't you understand? They moved us out totally. That's how we came to Esikado. So when my uncle came back, then I hear 
that the colonial police returned. They heard that the chief had come back. And this place was milling with people, no curfew, carrying sticks and all sorts of things. I hear that some were even holding matchets. Then the police came and here, just on this street, told the man, or told them what was shooting or some sort, or hooting in some sort, and says, Nani and Ketia, in the name of His Majesty the King, I give you 15 minutes to disperse this crowd. Um, okay, I think I've left something that first, my uncle people told all the people to throw the sticks and sit on the ground, right? That it's a peaceful thing that they're doing. So nobody's there to fight. Nobody should hit anybody and so on. When he said it in the name of his majesty, the king, my uncle also retorted, in the name of his majesty, the king, I give you five minutes to leave my territory. But of course, a British colonial officer being confronted by a primitive African chief, no matter how much education he had, he shouted, charge. On my uncle and started beating people here, the whole street, breaking windows and these things. That's how the house was savagely attacked and brought down and brought down and so on. So, but after that, they, they carried my uncle away and that was it, among other things. So I think I've told you enough, Sanam. They moved us out. They moved all, all the black people out of the area. European town. And it became European town, as it's pronounced. Because the Europeans took over all this area. All the areas you see. You see the buildings are different. This is all because of Europe. The post office is still there. This was where the chief used to stay, the Omahin of British Second D. Then here, somewhere here, was a tree. They called the tree Tamri Sea, and the story is, when we moved out of here, it was a sacred tree. They used to sit under it and do all kinds of things under it. They knew it was sacred. So when they left, then the British invited them to come and get the tree out. So they performed rituals. And when they pulled the tree down, that's when they saw it was a burial site as well, which they hadn't known. It was an ancient burial site. So they took the bones and so on and buried them in Kodjokrom. But the interesting thing, according to my great-grandmother, was that um, jewelry and so on had been buried with them and the British took them. They took all the way, they took away some of the artifacts.
in the past. She was an engineer. She was a test pilot. A very effective Air Force person. And Nkrumah, his association with that woman was entirely based upon the woman's competence in the air. And the woman tells you that her whole objective was to make sure that Ghanaian pilots felt at home in the air, that being in the air was going to be... So we'll stop there and we'll move on. This was designed as part of an installation. Thank you. And due to the global pandemic, very few people have seen this installation, which I installed in my studio in 2018. I think Thelma Golden is one of the few people who actually saw it set up. It's never been premiered. And running behind me is uh, footage from my studio building of the various artifacts that I used to represent different periods in Ghana's post-independence history. Two dolls, one a very famous doll called Auntie Day Day, in the shape of a European girl, holding a little rabbit, which sadly is one of Ghana's few early modernist industrial objects. Um, a later counterpart, a young boy holding a football with the words African champion on his back. A coin from the time of independence when Kwame Nkrumah put his head on a coin and oppositions in parliament complained that he took Queen Elizabeth's head off the coin, which is very problematic. The post office where the chief's palace was raised and replaced uh, the palace was raised and replaced with the post office. I had originally intended to make a feminist history of Ghana, knowing that queen mothers were traditionally the receptacles of history, but all the women I approached were afraid to be interviewed. They pointed me in the direction of men, um, which worried me and which is why I put my own voice over the narratives of men. Um, and one of the things that sort of I discovered, which I think I always knew theoretically, was that in pre-modern Africa, when a story was powerful, it was kept secret. It's sort of the opposite of today, where the more powerful the story is, the more it's shared. For those earlier generations, the more powerful a story, the more guarded it was by elites and parsed out in stingy little portions. And so the problem of how for our generation to recover some of these powerful stories and share them, when the elders are always nervous about what it means to share. Um, so I feel like that's sort of some of my duty um, as a cultural historian, as an artist, um, to try and work on ways to find these stories, share these stories, and use them to create new narratives of African modernity that debunk stereotypes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So our first words, mutually agreed upon, are thank you. Thank you, Rashida. Thank you, Tina, Saidia. Thank you, Simone, Simone, Simone. Thank you all for creating this space for us and for all of us to be here. I think um, we all feel immarveled is a word. <laughs> Shall it I is. Begin? Yes. yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Feel free to dance. <laughs> this is a story of stories. This is the story of a collaboration and a series of exchanges that span nearly 20 years. This is a transatlantic 
Afro-diasporic encounter. France, by way of the Ivory Coast. Europe, Africa. The United States, by way of the Caribbean. The Americas, in New York, in Paris, in Venice. Maîtrise les cérémonies, lunatiques. This is the story of a little book and its first translation, a transfer of the eye, on the basis of trust and understanding, a practice of diaspora. The book is only the point of departure of a long journey. The book is both pretext and matière première, raw material. It is anchored in the past, ponders the present, and holds high hopes for the future. This is a story of an offering. This book has created, among much else, a space of trans relation, a space for the expression of our shared commitment to a larger project of Afro-fluency. Afrofluency, that is, a recognition of the common experiences of racialized being in this world, and a submarine yearning toward borderless connection. A yearning that attests also to the fugitivity, the instability, the contingency, the idiosyncrasy of blackness in a global frame. Transatlantic, Afrodiasporic encounter, France by way of the Ivory Coast, Europe, Africa, the United States by way of the Caribbean, the Americas, in New York, in Paris, in Venice. This is about the possibility worlds can offer, but also the impossibilities, the limitations of worlds. A mother watching the video footage of her son's murder in a court of law does not, cannot speak. She utters something. She utters a sound. This wordless sound, at once opaque and untranslatable, generous and capacious in its offering of a common space in which to know, to recognize, to acknowledge, and to feel. Je dédie ce livre au regretté Dr. Colin A. Palmer, 1944-2019, maître de la diaspora, HNIC, qui n'a pas son deux. Au-delà de l'inestimable savoir transmis, il m'a proclamé Miss France dès 1999. D'abord étonné et perplexe, je n'ai été en mesure de saisir la portée symbolique de cette période que des années plus tard. Je conserve et prends soin de la précieuse couronne depuis. Pour cela, il me tient à cœur de lui témoigner mon éternelle gratitude. It is important to establish a frame, to set some parameters. We want to be clear what we're talking about. In fact, we must be clear what we're talking about. Words, terminology, they have meaning. And sometimes it is a good thing to go back to their original definition, precisely so that we may know what is at stake. Que l'on dise, que l'on utilise les termes maître, blanc, mal, riche, chrétien, civilisé, hétérosexuel, valide, métarécie ou encore discours dominant, chacun renvoie aux mêmes structures politiques hiérarchisée, mise en place par l'Occident depuis son entrée dans l'ère moderne. Subversion, it happens through refusal. It happens by opposing the deafening silence and toxic denial. It happens through the use of the pronoun I. So I am advocating for a form of unabashed solipsism. I consider my being, its sensations and its feelings, as constitutive of the only existing reality I can be sure of. My being, the life I have lived, my experiences constitute the foundations of my legitimacy and my authority. No one can speak in my place. Alors le point de départ, 
ce doit être le chaos et son acceptation totale. Il est question du chaos de l'histoire, le chaos des dispersions séculaires. Ce chaos s'est aussi immiscé dans les parties les plus secrètes, les plus intimes de ma vie. Perhaps we must recognize and accept both the permanence and the legitimacy of this chaos. It is based on rupture, invisibility, unspeakability, inaudibility, silence and incessant movement. It is based in what is unknown, what is impossible to recognize or to know, in mystery and in stories, great and small. Between the French language and myself stands history, an ancient history, at once rich and complex, international, splendid and painful, silent, forgotten, or quite simply denied. Pourtant, j'existe. Mais ça suffit. Ce détour doit être le dernier. Cette tentative d'explication doit être l'ultime. Parce que les explications, de même que les démonstrations, n'ont cessé d'être fournies et produites depuis des siècles. Qu'est-ce qui n'a pas été compris Qu'est-ce qui est si difficile à saisir We know that any system of domination, because it implicates human beings, be they inferiorized, minoritized, or dehumanized, is inevitably called on to confront strategies of resistance put into action by those most subjugated, most marginalized, and most violently affected by that system. These forms of resistance and contestation punctuate the history of the entire diaspora and include those of the African continent itself. Whether it be a question of Queen Jinga's defiance in the face of Portuguese authority, the echo of the explosion planned and directed by Colonel Delgres at Fort Matuba in Guadeloupe, heard throughout Black America and preserved in its memory, or the luminous revolt of the enslaved of Saint-Domingue, which gave birth to the world's first Black Republic, a republic that in the space of an instant gave true substance to the supposed universal ideals of the French Revolution of 1789. Whether it be a matter of the two victories of Imperial Ethiopia in the face of Italy's, again, Italy's colonial assaults, the Rastafari awakening in Jamaica that produced reggae music and whose international success unceasingly reminds us of the importance of grounded truth. Or, for that matter, the Martinican sisters, Paulette and Jeanne Nardal, graduates of the Sorbonne, translators and hosts of a celebrated literary salon, who laid the groundwork that allowed the monumental movement of negritude to flower. Or, finally, whether it be a question of a French and Martinican psychiatrist who, having been enlightened, joined the anti-colonial resistance in Algeria, or the victory of that very same Algerian nation in the face of France's arrogance and denial, or the Dien Bien Phu, or the group of women who declare themselves unapologetically black, or an anti-racist march across all of France in 1983, or rap songs in French, one of which in particular describes France as a land where, quote, the fascists are furious and niggers and ready to face their fire, unquote, or documentaries that persist in seeking out tenderness where its absence is expected, or in speaking up, projecting the bodies of black lady liberties onto white screens. These acts of resistance have been relentless. À chaque nation, son noir. Je décide d'être noir. Cette identité noire a des implications ainsi que des conséquences. La distance m'est impossible. Je ne la désire même pas. Je lui préfère le point de vue, l'approche, l'analyse située. Car, en vérité, nous le sommes toutes et tous. L'universalisme n'existe pas. Il est lui-même situé. Mon impression 
était que d'une certaine manière, je n'étais pas à ma place. Il fallait que je m'explique, que j'explique ma présence, que j'explique le fait que j'étais noire. Je n'étais pas à ma place. En anglais, je suis libre. Je peux m'exprimer sans entrave. Je peux me réinventer. Mais ce faisant, je crée et instaure de nouveaux silences. En anglais, je suis libre. My blood, my family, Sumoro and Binate, vertical, horizontal, extended, Mungani, Cotrel, Monier, Hall, moderne, Eglantine, continental and diasporic, constitutes the bedrock which I have had the good fortune and happiness of being supported by. I thank each member of our three generations engaged in this French experience. You are everything to me, the ground and the source. Mamadou and Alassane, my brothers. Masyami, Mabintu, Momian, Namizata, and Miriam. They are no more precious sisters than you. Naomi, Ismael, Iman, Soela, Lana, Diane, Remy, Kayla, Lola, and those to come, over to you. To Bamuso, no kru binate sumamo my mother. This collaboration was an intention. Cette collaboration était une intention. This collaboration was a choice. Cette collaboration était un choix. This collaboration is an offering. Cette collaboration est une offrande. This collaboration is precious. Cette collaboration est précieuse. This collaboration is a journey. Cette collaboration est une expédition. This collaboration is ongoing. Cette collaboration est infinie. Elle n'a pas de fin. Elle n'a pas de fin. <laughs> La musique.
Welcome to Lupolov Retreat, Venice. Please kindly take your seats now and refrain from taking photos and videos. Thank you for your cooperation and enjoy the performance. Benvenuti al Lupolov Retreat, Venezia. Vi preghiamo di prendere posto e di non fare foto e video. Grazie per la vostra collaborazione e godetevi lo spettacolo. Thank you. I know it's so good to, to connect and, and uh, to speak, but we are here and we are so delighted to be here. Um, just wildly honored to be among such esteemed colleagues. Um, I want to thank Simone for her div divining this uh, event that is both ancient and visionary and um, for her generosity of spirit. Um, Rashida for her vision and uh, Susan, Greta, Tina, all of the artists, all of the scholars who are participating in this, uni this absolutely extraordinary event, I want to thank you for your work. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce to you some of my new work uh, from a new album called Note Speak. At the end, you can get some more information about it up here on stage. Thank you. A tiny content warning. The first um, piece deals with immigration, the second with self-harm, the third with um, imprisonment, and the fourth with joy and unity. Samia, Yusuf, Omar Faster, 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 faster How you flew Running while chained You maintained every hope as you trained Your eyes on the pinnacle The Olympic Inspired Some would say even mystic Your name is a mantra for all women oppressed. The nature and means in which you went about your quest can only attest to your grandeur. How you flew. Samia Yusuf Omar Samia Yusuf Omar Samia Yusuf Omar Faster, 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 faster 
radiating star Shooting through the darkness Look down, shine the path to take Lead on, we will come Won't forget, radiate you star Burning brightly for the masses Look down and please light the road ahead Lead on, we will come It's me, I used to be my mom It's me, I Faster I have read that you were a joyous girl, though they called you a corrupted one. Bright sun, condemned for the sin of standing out, when that is what being a star is all about. Going about your business fearless, with dignity, a sense of humor as you tried for your family and for yourself to find a way to live a life away from the blunt edge of that blade. You stayed in that stateless society born in 1991, just like you, and just like you, it too died young. And while it had not so much to do with anarchy as with insanity and left behind chaos, death, and pain, you were left a heroine unsung. Ah, but you lit a light that still is hung. What a journey to undertake. Now that, that took heart, that took guts you had to endure indelibly imprinted upon that fresh start. So you leave from Somalia to Ethiopia, then from Ethiopia to Sudan, Sudan to Libya, arrived in Tripoli, headed for Europe, entry by Italy, you were almost there on the very last leg. Samia Yusuf Omar Samia Yusuf Omar Samia Yusuf Omar Faster, 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 faster Radiating star Shooting through the darkness Look down, shine the path to take Lead on, we will come Won't forget, radiate you star Burning brightly for the Look down and please light the road ahead Lead on, we will come Radiating star Shooting through the darkness Look down, shine the path to take Lead on, we will come Won't forget, radiate you star Burning brightly for the masses Look down and please light the road ahead Lead on, we will come, we will come, we will come. Samia, Yusuf, Omar. Samia. Thank you. If you would like to know more about Samia, you can find it in these booklets at the end of our performance. Um, we're going to go right into the next one. as much as someone who doesn't do it can. I understand the feeling of I cannot live in this skin. The feeling of when is this hurt gonna end? The feeling of how to get rid of this pain. How to distract my brain.
cutting now. Divorcing oneself from the ha, 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 gasping midnight wake, shivering, shaking, quake. I thought I was gonna die, but here I heave and heave and lie. Here I heave and heave and lie. I think I understand cutting now when there's no other choice, no delay, when you can't see beyond. When this moment is all, when I am feeling so small and I can not grip. Every signpost lost, no touchstone heals. No distraction to be found, no words to be read, no song to be sung, no solve for the wound, no spot that is safe, no respite, no grace. I think I understand cutting now. Layer, layer, layers thick all my lives, heaped like bricks covering inadequacies, <laughs> covering my insecurities walling up the interior covering what is past and done and gone safe from probing exteriors buried deep so deep I I cannot reach down 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 so deep only revealed on the cusp of sleep when defenses are released, when I'm almost at peace. Then the jerk, the pulling up, the breathless inhale as I flail and I flail. And there it is, though I had hoped that last time would be the last time. But here it is. The gasp, 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 the gasping midnight wake, shivering, shaking. Quake, and I think I understand cutting now. Thank you so much. All right. You ready, Marco? some steak and eggs with toast or that crispy fried chicken, tea, coffee, and a Coke. Sometimes it's all eaten. Sometimes it's left there. But you can believe it's never, ever fair. no sustenance that kind of sticks in your craw. The James and John and Peter and Andrew, they'll tell you that it's law.
baked potato sliced in half butter oozing through southern meal just for you salt rubbed on the wound now just shut up and chew enchiladas sausages ribs and tater tots george junius and leo jones just two among the lot truth ain't what they got murder fought with murder all done in his name dead and gone now buried deep and who is it we gotta blame the innocent the guilty sat up on the block murder fought with murder tick tick Del Barnes' last meal was the richest of them all. He called for justice and please equality. And for dessert, he asked solemnly for peace. Yeah, sometimes it's all eaten, and sometimes it's just left there. You better believe it ain't ever, it can never be fair. The innocent, the guilty, sat up on the block murder fought with murder tick tick talk tick tick talk tick tick talk Thank you so much. Just gonna do one more and we thank you for your attention. Um, that's Marco Cremaschini who's playing the piano so beautifully. Light, spark, scintilla, flame, blazing container within each part of the whole. Filaments bind, twine like audio cables, loving each other, all entangled. one apart, the coils neatly dressed. Canon, USB, MIDI, Thunderbolt, everyone that we need to make our music clear and clean. So we place each tenderly in one bag and when it's opened up again there they twist there they twine it is if they are desperate they cannot lay separate they're to, to connect to each other by any means found My back 
back is turned. They twirl around, they dance, they drink like they know I'm gone. Everywhere your eye falls, branches, tree trunks, mountain ranges, stratiform, muscle, sinew, bone, all separately linked, coil together to form a whole. Piles of yarn left to their own devices will also throw a riotous party with pink and orange and green colliding. Despite your best intentions, despite your couple rolling up, open that bag and there they drunkenly lie untucked. All this marvelous mess we tangle that we are connected by the light, bound by the dark, snarled up human hearts with our wires crossed. and fizz. We are effervescent, luminescent. A common blaze inside each of us. Ah, yes. All this marvelous mess we tangled that we are connected by the light, bound by our dark snare of human hearts with our wires crossed. Still we burn and sparkle and fizz. We are effervescent, luminescent. Connected by our light, bound by our dark, snarled up human hearts. Connected by our light, bound by our dark, those shadows and flames are woven. By us cross, I said. Connected by our light, bound by our dark, those shadows and flames are woven. Connected by our light, bound by our dark, those shadows and flames are woven. Talking over me, talk, talking over you, talking over me, talking over you, talking over me, talking over you, talking over me. We're connected by our light, bound by our dark, those shadows and flames are woven. Connected by our light, bound by our dark, those shadows and flames are woven. Connected by our light, bound by our dark, those shadows and flames were woven. Connected by our light, bound by our dark, those shadows and flames are woven. Connected by our light, bound by our dark, those shadows and flames are woven. I wonder if I could get you to participate with me. I wonder if I could get you to just say connected. That's the only word I want to hear. So if I say, we are all yeah, we are all, yeah. Despite the powers that be trying to divide you and me, we are all, yes. Man-made constructs want us to think differently, but we know that we are, yes. No single one way to be individually one, we are. Thank you so much. I'm Lisa Marie Simmons. That's Marco Cremeschini. We appreciate you participating with us. So in the, in the Italian tradition, these are libretti, um, which they give out at the opera, right? So these are our, our little libretti here on stage for anyone who wants one. Thanks again. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Nyla Rain Barnes. I am a recent graduate of Spelman College and am, <laughs> and am currently a reporting fellow with the Pulitzer Center, completing a multi-part journalism project on the Venice Biennale, focusing on loophole of retreat Venice. In early 2023, I will begin my Fulbright Research Fellowship in Dakar, Senegal on Black American women's expatriation patterns to Senegal.
I am honored to briefly introduce this afternoon's program of film screenings and conversations for Loophole of Retreat Venice. The films are also screening in the Sala de Chiostro de Caprese throughout the symposium. Following a screening of her film, Fresh Water, Dream Hampton will be in conversation with Amy Meredith Cox. Dream Hampton is a filmmaker and writer from Detroit. Her most recent works include the short films, We Hold These Truths, and the award-winning Fresh Water. Her Emmy-nominated Surviving R. Kelly earned her a Peabody Award. Amy Meredith Cox is a critical ethnographer, writer, yogi, and movement artist based in New York. She is the author of the award-winning book, Shapeshifters, Black Girls in the Choreography of Citizenship and Editor of Gender, Space. Her current work titled Living Past Slow Death includes two book projects and performance intervention. Following a screening of two of her short films, An Ecstatic Experience and Giverne One, Negresse Imperiale, Jatovia Gary will be in conversation with Legacy Russell. Jatavia Gary is a filmmaker and multidisciplinary artist working across film, video art, sculpture, and installation. Gary's work is presented internationally, and the artist had a recent solo exhibition at the Hammer Museum. Gary is a 2022 Guggenheim Fellow. Legacy Russell is a curator and writer. She is the executive director and chief curator of The Kitchen. Her first book is Glitch Feminism, a Manifesto. Her second book, Black Meme, is forthcoming via Verso Books. Following a talk featuring clips from her film, Garden Conversation, Bushra Khalili will be in conversation with Francoise Verger. Bushra Khalili is a Moroccan visual artist and cultural activist based in Berlin and Paris, whose work has been extensively exhibited in solo presentations and global biennales. Her work and, in her work, she emphasizes the civic function of art and invites us to meditate on the power of storytelling and critical fabulation as a form of resistance. Francoise Verger is a franco reunionese activist, curator, and writer. She also curates exhibitions, decolonial workshops, and performances with artists, refugees, and activists of color. Her most recent publication is titled A Feminist Theory of Violence. Enjoy. Hi, Dream. Is this? Oh, can you all hear me? Hi. Good afternoon. Um, I have to admit that I'm. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and staying and coming back <laughs> in after lunch. Yeah, I'm feeling a little bit sun drunk. You know what I mean? Like that feeling when surrounded by so much beauty, enveloped in so much beauty like the sun, you feel a little bit high. So <laughs> I'm, feeling, I'm feeling that right now. I'm so grateful to be here and be in conversation with you, Dream. Oh, it's a you, beautiful Amy. film. It's a beautiful film. And I just wanted to start by um, reflecting on how I returned to witnessing the film last night. So Dream and I were out to dinner, and if any of you have spent more than five minutes with Dream, you know she is prolific in many things. And the way that Dream's mind works is a beautiful thing to, to be in the company of. So our conversation spanned everything from farming in Palestine to Somalian pirates to the academic industrial complex. It was, just, it was everywhere yes. and with depth. <laughs> and so after that conversation, I felt that I needed to go home. Well, wait, and, can we just elaborate on mm -hmm. this? So there should be terrorist farming as there have been for millennia in Palestine and monocrop and uh, carry and, the government of Israel has started this like same kind of cropping that they did that ruined Oklahoma. And then the other thing, <laughs> See? no, this but I don't want to just drop that. <laughs> Terrorist farming, if you ever go to Palestine, have a chance to see where some of it still exists. Yeah. And what was the other thing you said? Somalian pirates. Oh, her creative, because Milan, y'all watch the, um, the, does the series on the mafia from Naples. They've been, hold, they've been re receiving the chemicals and the, the trash basically from the Milanese luxury fashion business. Hmm. And they were shallow dumping in Naples. So many people got like 
sick from it, cancer and all kinds of other diseases. And so then they began dumping along the Somali coastline, this like, which is the mm-hmm. longest coast longest coastline in the world. I didn't, I'm just reading stuff, by the way. I didn't, I didn't investigate, report this. But, and, and then that rendered the water dead. And so Somalis who've been fishing that land for millennia, um, the waters are dead. And then we got Somali pirates. So we just talking about how like, me wearing Louis Vuitton or whatever the heck is responsible for the Somali fishing. So you see what I mean? <laughs> That's so, what it was. So after this conversation, <laughs> I, I returned to Freshwater last night and I, for some reason, so I've, I've watched it once with just the sound. So I wasn't, I wasn't actually watching it, I was listening to it as a meditation. And then I watched it a second time without the sound and just the images, which to me are also a meditation. And I'm wondering for you, it, to me it was just such a gift that you gave us, and I'm thinking about your previous work, and I don't want to sort of place you or stick you in a genre, but when I think of you and all that you hold and all the information that you share with us all of the time, it does feel like information giving in the very traditional sense, right? Beautifully, beautifully written and beautifully poetic, but information giving that is different than what I experienced in Freshwater as a deeply meditative yeah. experience. And so I'm wondering for you, when you were working on Freshwater, how that practice of stepping into um, memory, stepping into thinking about, and we'll get into all of this, how that might have been or maybe not yeah. different from the ways that you've approached your previous Films. Yeah, no, thank you for that reflection. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, my first film was a scripted short called I Am Ali, my first thing out of film school. But in 2018, I did three kind of heavy lifts of films. Yeah. Um, the one thing that people saw, usually we do work and some folks will see it and most people don't. Um, and so I did three projects in 2018 that came out in 2019 and two of them most folks didn't see. It was this docu-series called um, Finding Justice. And then um, this piece that we shot inside of an Indiana prison called mm-hmm. Pen- in Pendleton um, called uh, It's a Hard Truth, Ain't It? And then Surviving R. Kelly was the one that folks watched. Um, but all three of those were like documentaries. They were di- incredibly didactic. Um, and then they were being funded at a level I hadn't been funded at all three projects. Um, it's a Hard Truth on it, Ain't It? It was on HBO, um, and BET did Finding Justice. Um, they don't really have no money, but it was may- way more money than I had doing my own little films. Um, and in every of those situations, what happens when something is, when there's capital, when a project is friggin' funded, and we, y'all know this in whatever area you're in, if you're an artist, an academy, or a filmmaker, then you just start getting notes from people. (laughs) So, like, there's a healing that has to come from um, dealing with corporate America. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic handed that to me, you know. um, It's very limited what you get offered after you have something that breaks through. So I hope that no one hopes for a breakthrough because it's not like a reward, you know. On the other side of that is people asking you to do the same thing over and over again. Mm. Um, which is fine because I didn't even get an opportunity to do that because the whole industry shut down. So like, yeah. as soon as I got so-called hot, it was like over. <laughs> so um, I did what I usually do, which is I gathered my friends and we made two short films. Mm. Um, and this one I had been working on right before the pandemic started. I was thinking about flooding. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about memories. I was thinking about basements. Um, I was thinking about, you know, in Detroit, um, there's a lot of organizing. Um, Adrian Marie Brown has kind of been the ambassador of the work that a a whole collective of folks were doing. When Grace Lee Boggs first brought Margaret Wheatley to Detroit and we started having these conversations about, you know, reorganizing our movement work, looking at bio patterns. So we were looking at starling murmurations and we were looking at, um, all the stuff y'all already know, mycelium, all, you know, we was doing all that. <laughs> Trying to change that, the hierarchy that involved, that's, that's in the movement and all the different things. Because Detroit is an innovative, and we innovate in the D. And, um, and so in that work, I remember looking at the land and looking at 
how as racial capitalism collapses, and it's been doing that in Detroit since the 50s, um, Grace Lee Boggs tells us that it wasn't like the 80s when these factories started emptying out. It was almost as soon as they opened, they were laying people off by the thousands. And so as racial capitalism collects, collapses, there's this like decolonization that the land is doing itself as a reclamation so that you'll have grass five feet tall. Detroit was built on canals. Right. I think about Venice in this way. I've been coming here. And I'm going to stop talking so you can ask mm. some. I mean, we don't even have that much time, but we've been coming here since 99, right? Um, every Biennale I come, and um, since 99, and, you know, Venice, I know Venetians don't like to say that Venice is sinking, you know, the water's rising. It's like, okay, either way, the steps is disappearing. Um, and... And in, and, you know, and along the Great Lakes, whether it's, yeah. you know, Erie, Huron, Michigan, we're experiencing something that doesn't get the attention that the coasts get. And so it just had me thinking. And it was an opportunity to do something small. And this is my most personal film. I don't usually narrate. I like, yeah. after Days of Heaven, yeah. after Terrence Malick did that, I'm like, no one ever has to narrate anything. Like, just don't. Um, but whatever. I narrated it. But, and, and you know, and if, and to me, it feels like as someone who loves Detroit, it feels very much like a love letter to Detroit. The sound, the way that yeah. you use sound is just exceptional. But more than that, the images that, you know, again, it just felt to me like a deeply embodied meditation. And when we think about water, you know, we often think about how folks navigate the precarity of water on a daily basis in a place like Venice or in coastal regions, but we don't often think about water in the interior, particularly in the interior of the, of the U.S., the U.S. Yeah. Midwest. And so to think about Detroit, Michigan, but specifically Detroit as a site of possibility yeah. um, for ecological transformation, to think about being close to one of, or is it the largest freshwater body, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it is. And so what that means to also think about Michigan as a place of deep toxicity when we think about water. And the interior as a place that for black folks, especially when we think about black Detroit and the black Midwest, feels like a place that we were moving towards. I'm trying to get a lot of themes in here. So oh, no. Like move, Go <laughs> moving it, towards yes. this, this theme of mobility, but also kind of once we were there, and I'm thinking specifically of Detroit, this narrative of stasis. And so this narrative of mobility that is really a tie, tied to ideas of progress, ascendancy, sort of linear success, and stasis as like decay and dying. But there's something in stasis, and I'm thinking about a flood, and the waters of a flood is different from a hurricane, like a hurricane yeah, moving absolutely. through, right? And a flood where there's still water, right? We think about what that does to rot and decay, but there's also something else it does. And I'm thinking about memory in that quote from from Toni oh, Morrison, so, right? right? talking about aquaponic gardening? Yeah, what are you talking about? Okay, so, yes. So, so, and I wonder if yes. there's a way that we can connect the idea of, of so movement and that. stillness and also maybe even, and when we think about black life, the ideas of movement and stillness and what we might learn from water. Thank you. And those reflections, I accept them. They're beautiful. Um, and, and I'm thinking about so many people's work. I'm thinking about you know, I don't, I don't think it was Christina Sharp that was talking about water as archive. Not here, but she did have a piece on water that was deeply inspiring to me. Um, Toni Morrison, uh, Sandra Jackson Dumont had just shared mm. with me about, um, because anywhere in the Midwest you're talking about people kind of following the Mississippi River up to the yeah. Midwest from the South. Um, we have other populations in Detroit, um, Arab, um, Hmong who come from Vietnam. We have like other populations in Detroit, but Detroit is a black city. Um, so coming from the South, they're following the Mississippi, and they would have gone to Ohio, they would have gone to Chicago, they would have gone to Indiana. And she said, you know, they straighten out the Mississippi River in places, this is Toni Morrison, to make room for um, horse and livable acreage. Occasionally, the rivers flood these places. Floods is a word they use, but in fact, it is not flooding, it is remembering. So she's talking about water making its way back yeah. to and reclaiming what's rightfully it, you know, what it, mm -hmm. it's a decolonization. It's like an action as nature, and, and we see in it everywhere. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? We see bears come up in your house and with their little posable thumbs and opening your refrigerator <laughs> and closing it back. Um, yeah. Marsha Smith is here. She knows that I'm always looking for, out for sharks because they about to walk up into the grocery store. Um, <laughs> Even, you know, so we, the reclamation is happening and there is going to be yeah. 
great pain. I'm not trying to talk about it in some romantic way because what you're talking about, that stillness and that stasis, what I was concerned about in terms of interiority, when I look at a basement of a house, when I look at a foundation of a city, Detroit, black Detroiters are the foundation of Detroit. Obviously, they're brought there, they're lulled there through racial capitalism, through this incredibly, like, a, a, a project, you know, um, industrialization that choked the lungs of this very planet, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so while we can claim to be the home of techno and jitten and all this amazing, you know, stuff, Detroit is also, you know, one of the homes of the, the industrialization that has this planet on its knees, but it was always a failed project, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so that lack of mobility that you're talking about. And you know, another thing is Detroit, the name of Detroit on the Underground Railroad was um, Midnight. Code name Midnight is the whole name of the stop. Mm -hmm. It was the stop before you went to Canada. So that idea of to keep going, yeah. you know, north, which in itself is problematic. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the global mm -hmm. north as opposed to the global south. Um, there are so many places to go with it, but I didn't want to be didactic when I was making this film, right. even though I was yapping over it, doing a narration. So I appreciate and accept your reflections. No, that's yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But thank y'all. Thank you. We good? Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's so much more I can say. I know. We want to give people could, their time. Though. Okay. Go ahead. We have two minutes. Could I? Could you say, I just would love. Look, Rashida's looking. Okay. okay. I would love for you to speak to sound. I mean, I was just. Oh, so, sound. Like, just, yeah. yeah, Sterling Tolls, first of all. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. Sterling. Um, I hope, I don't even know if folks are awake in Detroit, but um, this is going to keep running. And yes, yeah, Sterling Tolls, my um, producing partner on this, Invincible. Sterling Tolls is an amus amazing artist. This piece, um, Jova Lynn, who's here, curatorial, young genius, um, mm -hmm. she included my show. So it was installed at MoCat, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit, with two, art two other artists who I deeply respect. Y'all saw Nagara here talking about Toni Morrison. And she, um, I I'm sure she would be okay with me saying she's a part of a collective, I'm sure she's part of many collectives, but called Black Constellation in Detroit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and Nepsidu, who was also showing in the show that Jova curated at MOCAD, it was the three of us artists. So Sterling did the sound, um, there's a flautist there. Sterling had been going around the state of Michigan recording water without mm -hmm, my even mm -hmm. doing this. So it was just this beautiful, you know, simpatico, this moment, and he's my brother. and. Um, you know, Detroit is small. It, it, for that reason, it can be dramatic and tiresome and all the other things. But um, it's home and it's family. That was my real family that I was showing. I recently got an archive. So to see other people include um, the sister from Brazil who showed a clip of that film of um, the young person going through their own family photo archive. Um, it was good to see all of this work connecting and intersection. And we said that we weren't going to go on about how grateful we are to be in the room, that just yeah. the gratitude is like, we don't even have to speak it, no, but it, we're so grateful like to hear all of these presentations, you know. Um, the very first one, um, yeah. Georgia May's mom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, talking about going to ground um, and being in cadres, uh, in this moment, like I do have dystopian fantasies about what an apocalyptic scenario would do bring to my city, quite frankly. I, I, it was wild to me. One of my other homes is Martha's Vineyard, and it was wild to me to have DeSantis, you know, ship folks out because I'm like, wow, Florida, you're more likely to be a climate refugee than almost any other person in America. Yeah. Like, Florida is going to be producing climate refugees, is producing climate refugees already, and will continue in the next few decades. It's going to become actually quite pressing. Mm -hmm. And so I think about Detroit being this place, yeah, where we have a lot of fresh water, and that doesn't make me hopeful, like somehow I'm in a sanctuary. Right. Right. It makes me feel, because it's a fear-based ass country where it's more, we're not, we're not there, thank God, but where there are more um, guns than people, and so it, it, it makes it actually dangerous, right. you know? So you have people like Bill Gates buying like a million acres of land in the Upper Peninsula, mm -hmm. and. Michigan is known for its militias. And so it's this whole, you know, yeah. in fact, when we shoot at my daughter's feet underwater, uh, these militias were training in the park that we were at. The sound mm. became, it was just bouncing off the walls. And I was like, we gotta go. I was telling my DP. Um, and, and later we found out that park was used uh, by some militias that went to 
the on January sixth to the wow. insurrection. Wow. So, wow. so it's not like a safe place, even though we have war. And then the other image in there, and I'll leave it at this, but of Joe Lewis coming down the arena, named after the um, incredible boxer Joe Lewis, where I saw Prince first and Eddie Murphy's Raw, and I just you know it's like a home to me. Watching that be torn down by Hemrick which is this corporation that was responsible for cutting off um, thousands of Detroiters water each week mm -hmm. during the height of the Detroit water shutoffs, which is different than Flint's water crisis, but not unrelated. So mm -hmm. for me, I mean, again, not wanting to be didactic and explain all of that, but the thing that makes me tear up when I'm watching my own film is that Hemrick taking down Joe Lewis Arena. Right. Right. And I think, and what I would just want to quote you, um, when I think about Detroit, it taught me to be fearless. That line just stays with me, it taught me to be fearless. So even though we don't necessarily wanna fall into easy hope or think that this is gonna be, you know, this yeah. closeness to fresh water, but Detroit teaches us how to be fearless. And I don't, and I wanna also complicate, obviously, I'm not, I don't have to complicate the word resilience, it's being complicated. Um, the filmmaker who did um, Katrina Babies has a beautiful piece about unpacking how we need to stop using resilience as a framework. Um, but yes, uh, I, I, I kind of lack fear and um, Detroit is gonna figure it out. Thank you. <laughs> All right, y'all, thank you. <laughs>Good afternoon. I forgot how these are receptacles of rage and anxiety, so I should have trigger warning all of you. Um, but thank you for being here and for watching and for sharing this space with us. So much gratitude to Rashida mm -hmm. and to Simone and to Tina and to Saida and everyone, all of you here and Legacy. You said it. I just wanna start, because um, we're sitting inside of that screen and um, you know, to, the, to reflect on to the words of kind of being in the break and then being in the wake, right? Where those two things occupy and what it means to kind of exist inside of a brokenness. I'm wondering maybe if you could talk a little bit about you know, what does it mean to kind of break these images? Because you know, as we look at these gardens that we just saw, can think so much about the kind of viral sensation of those gardens, where they've traveled and where we maybe as black folks have seen these images. We've seen them on mugs. We've seen them in the doctor's office. We've seen them on mouse pads, right? All the, all the kind of uh, garden swag, if you will. And the thing that I think is really remarkable is the way in which, of course, you are centering the black femme inside of this history and breaking apart how we neutralize these images. So by kind of putting us in the frame, right, it allows for us to think differently about the violence of these images as they circulate. So I'm wondering, Dutavi, if you can maybe, let's start there, to talk about that idea of what that breaking is, right, breaking open that, that assumption of neutrality mm -hmm. of the image. Well, yeah, maybe I can start with a little bit of context because this, this last film, Giverny One, Negresse Imperiale, it, it comes out of an experience in Giverny, France. Mm -hmm. I was awarded an art residency, my first ever artist residency in Giverny, France in 2016. And so I found myself in this space and at the same time that all of this very extreme violence was happening. So I'm surrounded by you know, this beautiful, bucolic luxury um, while scrolling on the phone and seeing viral images of death. And so there was this extreme dissonance, mm -hmm. you know, there was a kind of fracturing and fragmentation that was happening internally and psychologically. I feel like you can almost feel that, you know, coming off the screen. And that's like high cue what I'm chasing. I'm trying to get you to have an effective response. I'm trying to get you to have a very, you know, deep emotional response to what you're seeing. And then maybe we can tarry over the intellectual, right? So for me, I was attempting to reconcile what was happening and what was going on with me at the time. This is all very personal. Um, while also responding to the things that are happening to the collective. I was removed from my uh, care systems, but I was alone in this place. 
I was supposed to be performing gratitude, right? Oh, I'm so happy to be here, which I'm totally happy to be here, right? I'm not performing mm -hmm. that's real. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, you know, supposed to be a good little negress and enjoy the Calvados and the Brie and the gardens. But I felt like I was in a straight jacket that was like delicate French lace, you know, really beautiful straight jacket. So, you know, this was me trying to work through all of those things. Um, but I, I, I find that placing us in the frame is one thing. And then there's the idea of completely exploding the frame, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think I heard Rizvana Bradley say that for the first time, maybe in like 20, 17, right? And so experimentation and creating these fractures, creating these, these, these moments of like dissonance visually and sonically, for me is about uh, opening up a space, right? You talk about in your book how the glitch is a, a space of subversion, right. right? And so for me, that's what this is about because I'm ignoring, completely ignoring the three act structure that you see in most films. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that, you know, to the point of those, those point that sort of the structure and the way the structure is reframed? Because I think mm -hmm. some of the editorial decisions that you make, right, what is seen and not seen, mm -hmm. right, what is renegotiated, um, as well as the way that you kind of reframe the frame is really important. Yeah. So, you know, I went to film school and even before film school, I was studying film in undergrad. I studied you know, black studies and then, you know, documentary studies. So I was going into film school, you know, mm -hmm. feeling like I knew a little something. Uh, but they were telling me, no, you have to do it this way. And I, you know, I'm hard headed and I don't want to do it in the way that they wanted me to do it. So I just began to start creating these, you know, these little projects that were going against the instructions, all right, just deliberately disobeying. And for me, it was not about beginning, middle, and end. It never really is. It's not about that line. It's about the circle, the loop. And I feel like the structure of a lot of my work is based on the black musical tradition, right? I'm a Southern person. I was raised by Pentecostal evangelicals in the church. So there's all this music, right? There's this long tradition of sound. And for me, it is about the repetition the loop as much as it is about the break. You feel me? So, I don't know, for me, each work demands a new jatavia, it feels like. Each work demands that I show up in a new space uh, and completely recalibrate what I think each film should look like. There is no formula. So the idea that, you know, boy meets girl and then they have a falling out and then they get back together and there's this you know, redemptive denouement where everything is reached stasis again. I don't... You don't give us that. Yeah. You don't give us that. You're going to have to do a little work. You right. know, you're going to have to, to stretch a little bit uh, beyond uh, that nice little bow that's usually tied up at the end of the film. Um, because I don't think life is like that. I don't think that we have... Uh, I, I'm kind of against the project of hope. You know, I don't know if there's a redemptive denouement for us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're not going to get it in the film either. Right, right. And, and I, I'm curious to hear you maybe reflect further, right, about um, kind of to be, to be against that hope, right? I, that uh, sounds no, horrible, No, right? no, no, but I think it's actually a really important um, maybe provocation, and I want to go there with you because there is something, of course, that's inside of both of these incredible works that we've just spent time with um, that pushes us further to ask questions about redemption and hope and forgiveness, right? Or as well, right? Thinking about questions of unfreedom and freedom. So, Javier, can you maybe unpack that a little bit, right? Because I think that the relationship as a kind of through line is really important with the work that you make and as well the ways in which you help us kind of see differently how the world can be authored. Yeah, I think I'm just kind of really obsessed with the end of the world. You know, I feel like I'm having like an existential crisis that's last like 38 years, you know, long. Um, and so I'm just kind of like always, you know, I was telling Legacy that I, I can almost feel, and I told you all, I could feel the anxiety coming off of the, the work. And this is early work, like this is 2015 and 2017 mm -hmm. respectively. And things have kind of taken a shift, you know, in terms of uh, concept. Form is still, you know, moving along in the same lines, but, you know, conceptually I was responding to the moment, mm -hmm. right? And the moment was incredibly violent and brutal. You know, I was at protests. I was working for a very 
well-noted white male filmmaker, so kind of toiling at his shop and then going home and etching around the face of Ruby D, trying to like have some dignity, you know? Um, and then like, it just all felt at that time very, I'm trying to be positive, you know? Like, <laughs> it all at the time felt a little bit, um, you know, like it was all for naught, you know? And that if I could just make these things and leave them behind, that perhaps someone would find them, you know, at some other point and be transformed. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? So I don't know if that's answering your question yeah, at all, yeah. but I don't know, these were very emotional and very personal works, even though I'm only featured in one of them. I'm very much speaking to um, my own emotional landscape, you know? I'm curious about how you have taken the work, right? Because, of course, we just had the pleasure of seeing this on the big screen, right? And together in this auditorium. But you also, there, there was a moment, if I'm remembering correctly, where some of these works existed on the internet during this very particular period of time of 2020, right? And I think the part that was so exceptional about that was that um, you're making the decision about where the work would live and how it might be screened differently. The way that it traveled was um, remarkable. I think the you know, folks were sharing those things and exchanging those things in real time, but also it, it, to the point of the time that it was made, intersected with a moment that didn't feel so distant, right? right. So it kind of brought two parts of a historic arc together and then fractured that even further further. So I'm, I'm curious to hear you maybe reflect about the time, of course, it was made, but then also, you know, as we kind of stand in this moment now, in this very special space right now, um, what does it mean to kind of have your work have traveled in this way, right, that exists both within this format of screening, but also, of course, is intersected with the same sites that you have drawn parts of your archive from, you know, these sites of, of digital space, of online space, and how those things, of course, have this special relationship of being kind of in the glitch. It, it feels like a lot of these moments of spectacular violence are not occurring online anymore, almost. You know, or maybe I'm wrong, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But there was a moment where we were seeing video after video after video after video, and now it feels like it's kind of underground because we were responding to the videos, right? People were going out on the streets, and they were, they were setting shit on fire. So it's almost as if these things are still happening, but they are... Vision differently. Yes. Vision differently. It's not being traded, you know, online in the same way. And so... I don't know, I think that, I'm, first of all, I'm grateful that the work has traveled, but I think also when we talk about these spaces of rarefied air, um, there, is, there was a dissonance for me in being there. And I think what Giverny One is also trying to touch upon is this kind of class difference, right? This class differentiation, like who gets to go to the garden? Who gets to exist in the garden? Absolutely. What do the negresses in the garden owe oh, the negresses who were not in the garden? So. I don't know. I'm, I'm grateful for the work traveling, of course. I'm grateful for all of the, the things that have come about because of the work. But I do think that there, you, there's a part of me that has to trouble my own uh, reality as a result of the work, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm wondering if we can t kind of switch perspectives maybe a little bit and talk a little bit about grief and witness. Because... Obviously, inside of both of these works, um, we are doing some amazing work, and you have kind of created that space of us being able to kind of think about black femme space and how you are caring for these images, what the archival relationship mm -hmm. is with mm -hmm. the image, right? And then, of course, what it does for us to kind of bear witness, right, in, in, in exchange, you know, in community. Uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about that relationship? What does it mean to kind of have, you know, it, the the representation of both yourself, right, but also your caring for other black femmes that are in the frame. Yeah, I think the care, and this is why Hartman and Sharp are so special to me, because the care is about that archival engagement, right? It's about like tarrying over that image mm -hmm. for months. Like, so a part of the process, we can talk about process for a minute, yeah. A part of the process is material, like direct, contact with the material of the film, the 16 millimeter um, strip, right? So I'm etching into the emulsion of the film around Ruby Dee's face. And so there's 24 frames per second. So to do that two minute clip took me about three months, right? With my hand, right? You know, really trying to 
work through what I'm feeling. So I'm getting familiar and intimate with every nuance of Ruby Dee's face. Every lip curl, every eyebrow raise, every turn, every twitch. It's, it's to me, that is what separates what I'm doing from many of my beloved peers, and this isn't me trying to flex, but the fact that I have a digital practice that is married to an archival practice, and that archival practice is analog, and that analog infuses such a deep amount of energy, like frenetic and kinetic life force that feels as though it is jumping off the screen. And so my care is evident in what I am choosing, how, like how I am choosing it, and how I am treating the subjects in the frame. Um, so the archival engagement of the work is so, you know, it's, it's, it's just, a, you know, it's paramount to my entire practice. Um, and I know that it's sweeping the globe right now, this kind of archival, for those of you who study film or who make film, this kind of archival aesthetic. And I wanna draw a distinction, and I have to cite Ayana Dozier here, between an archival aesthetic and an archival engagement, right? Like, you know, we're all going on YouTube and grabbing things and making a little mashup, and it's mm -hmm. cool, it's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. Eisenstein would love that. Those Soviet montage guys, they would love that you're doing that. But I think the idea of tarrying with the image, of sitting with it, and understanding where it's coming from, and why you are pulling it out of its context, and what new context are you attempting to create? What are you saying? Right? So for any of the young filmmakers out there, that is my, you know, my encourage, what I, what I, my message to you, what I encourage you to, to consider when you want to make a found footage film, when you want to make a mashup, is to really establish a relationship with the material, right? Instead of just, you know, what's cool, what's going to go with the song, you know? Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so... Javia, let's talk about performance, because this is an interesting thing that I think some folks are, are familiar with as they've followed your work, understanding your relationship to performance specifically, right? Um, and of course, right, we see you featured in this work, but, you know, your relationship to performance-based practices is something that extends through and beyond the frame. So can you maybe reflect a little bit about, you know, what does performance do within your practice, right? And the kind of thinking as well about, you know, the amazing and complex um, black feminist radical traditions, right, of what mm -hmm. that has meant for holding space for somatic work, mm -hmm. um, what that means to you. Yeah, so before I was an, I've been an artist since I was a little girl, and before I was a filmmaker, I was an actor from like maybe 12 to like 25. So really young, you know, learning poetry and prose and going to those oratory competitions and dressing really nice and getting a ribbon and all of those things. And then of course in church, of course. So like that was to me the first very real serious artistic practice that I had and it carried on even to now, right? I'm not on stage now, but I am like, you know, sneaking myself into my work, right? <laughs> like, how can I embody my ideas myself? And for me, shifting from performer to director was definitely about agency. It was definitely about control. Um, and not wanting to small up myself to fit into some weird conception about what black womanhood is and how it's represented in film and television. But rather, how can I use my own self, employ my own body, my own voice, my own face in order to bring forth my own ideas. So there's a long line of performance, uh, of performers, of course, folks like Ruby Dee, um, and you know, like, who I feel like have pushed me to be a little bit more fearless. Because if I'm gonna be honest, I definitely ran away from acting. I definitely felt foreclosed upon in that space. And so t coming back as a director and putting my own body into the space has felt quite liberating, right? I've been able to return to what I felt like was a self-actualizing and healing practice mm -hmm. that I used as a young person. Um, so the theater, being able to embody stories, embody an idea on stage in real time, for me, as a child, as a teenager, was something that was very healing. 
I had a very kind of disruptive and destabilized childhood, but I, I went to this performing arts high school where I had these very strong black women who were putting me on to the black literary tradition and folks like Pearl Primus, like really trying to understand the tradition mm -hmm. and locate myself in that tradition. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the, the acting work or the performance work that you're seeing here is of course very different than the usual, you know, the Hollywood stuff. Uh, but again, this is me attempting to meet my own needs, right? I appreciate it. I'm hearing the tambourine, so that's our oh, time. That's but I'm just so grateful <laughs> for this moment, of course, Otavia, with you, and grateful for the opportunity to be here with you all. Thank, Thank you. Greetings, everyone. My name is Ayana Thompson, and I am a senior art history major, curatorial studies minor from Chicago, Illinois, at Spelman College. Thank you, thank you. I am honored to briefly introduce our final presenters for day one of Loophole of Retreat, Venice. Sharifa Rhodes Pitt is the author of Harlem is Nowhere, A Journey to the Mecca of Black America, a New York Times notable book of 2011 and National Book Critics Circle finalist. Rhodes Pitt is an assistant professor of writing at Pratt Institute in New York. Leslie Hewitt is an artist based in New York and Houston and associate professor of, the, of art at the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. Her approach to photography and sculpture reimagines the art historical still life genre from a post-minimalist pr perspective. She also works with site-specific installation, autonomous sculptures, collage, and the moving image as modalities to contend equally with shifting notions of space and time. Maza Mengiste is a writer based in New York. She is author of The Shadow King, shortlisted for the 2020 Booker Prize and Beneath the Lion's Gaze, her debut, set, selected by The Guardian as one of the 10 best contemporary African books. Maza is a recipient of the Amer American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature. Finally, Stella Nyanzi is a medical excuse me, medical anthropologist, social justice activist, artist and opposition p politician from Uganda, currently living in G Germany, excuse me. <laughs> she is a scholar of the Writers in Exile program of Penn Zentrum Deutschland. Although she was imprisoned in maximum security prison for writing one poem, she wrote and published 194 poems while detained. One more note, there are also performances at the swimming pool following these sessions. And thank you so much and have a great Friday. Hi everyone. I'm so glad to be here. I give so much thanks and love to the organizers, my friends, Simone and Rashida, every one of the vast team that has been part of this in all kinds of levels, and just the great gift it is to be here with all of you. Um, a lot of the work that I've shared publicly uh, has to do with other places where I have not, where I'm a stranger and also with a sense of deep engagement with history. And I was going back into and found something that I've never read publicly before that is a bit more of a personal history and um, about home. We were not raised in the street. Many afternoons of childhood were spent at the windowsill with the curtains draping our backs like cloaks. There, we peered through mesh, through square panes, beyond the hedge guarding the front porch, across the yard, and into the street. It was a small yard, but it seemed to slope away from the house like a vast plain running toward the horizon. It was a busy street, and there was no sidewalk. This was cited as one of, one of the reasons for our confinement. Our street lay perpendicular to another road, our house sat at the dead end where they met. At the intersection was a bus stop. The windowsill offered a view onto the crowds of teenagers deposited there daily, 
with after-school courting rituals and the occasional battle royale. Also across the street was a rundown house that was often the setting of some dramatic scene the matriarch habitually carried away after midnight by an ambulance or sudden threats in broad daylight. One daughter brandishing a knife at, one, at another in the front yard. At least twice, a speeding car came down that oncoming road and as if the street continued, carried into our yard, mauling a tree, stopping just short of the house. We went to the window to see what was the matter. There, at the windowsill, we learned to observe but not to participate. We were not a part of the life going on outdoors, so that on the few occasions we ventured out for a walk with our mother to visit a neighbor down the road, we went like strangers who did not know the way. The scale of the neighboring houses looked different on foot than from the window of our passing car. At the windowsill observatory, nothing was complete. You did not have access to the beginning, middle, and end. At least one element of that sequence would always remain unavailable. You had the climax. You had the headlights from a crashed car shining into the bedroom window, the flash of the blade in the sun, the muffled shouts of the crowd swooning as the first blows fell. You relied on speculation to make up for what was not seen. The car provided another view. Anything appearing on the highway or street had the quality of an image whirling round a zoetrope, the eyes scanning the scene before it whips out of sight. The disappearing image persisted by way of willful grasping, not an involuntary optic trick. Beyond the car window were the fields that ran alongside the highways, undeveloped tracts of land connecting one part of the city to the next, strung with electrical wire atop towers. The landscape was dotted with contraptions prospecting for oil. Cows or horses were turned onto the disused fields, feeding on the brush among signs offering the acreage for development. There were not roads to carry us into those vistas. The distance seemed unfathomable. There was never a figure by which to set a scale. But once I looked out the car window and did see a figure in the distance, a boy in a tracksuit straddling a pipe that spanned a bayou. He was scooting his way across the pipe. It was a place we passed daily on the way home from school, but I had never seen a figure in that scene, and I didn't alert anyone else in the car to what I saw. Instead, I wondered, was it a dare? There were no witnesses gathered round to see the deed accomplished. Was he trying to escape? There were no pursuer pursuers. Did he survive the crossing? We continued on and I left him there, alone on the pipe, his endeavor unaccomplished. My brief witness could not provide an account of heroism or attest to last moments or teenage folly. There were other stories like that with parts missing because you'd arrived in the middle or hardly arrived at all, your eyes happening upon the spot, then your body carried away by the moving car. I have a friend who grew up here and when the city was still wild, in some, pa some places unpaved, not yet disciplined into the current municipal order. As a boy, he used to walk across town as one of a group of friends making expeditions from the fifth ward on the city's northern side to the south side of town, the location of my childhood windowsill. Now there is a highway that covers the passage from north to south that my friend made on foot. Several dozen houses were destroyed to build it. The houses that were not taken over sit uncomfortably close to the highway's edge so that if you didn't know the houses had been there first, you'd wonder why anyone would choose to build there. Now there are condominiums purposefully built right upon the highway with balconies advertised as having breathtaking views. But some of the roads walked in my friend's childhood are still there. I've always been fascinated by the name of the old Spanish trail a street name that manages to be both vague and precise. It was an old story preserved despite the dive bars and strip malls, covered wagons replaced by joy rides and drag races next to the park. Some of the roads are gone. I think of the bricks of Anderson Road, paid for and laid one by one by freedmen because the city preferred to leave them with dust. When the old houses of that area were all finally gone and the new buildings made of metal referred to as lofts sprang up to replace them, you knew the bricks that had been there more than a century would soon be pulverized. 
In a city where history is constantly subject to the bulldozer, the only thing unchanging from my friend's childhood to mine was the sky up above our heads. Later, we moved to another street and another windowsill. The view from there also presented us with across the way neighbors who enacted regular ritualized purges of familial demons. These scenes drew one out of bed to the front window, the interior lights unlit to look through the lace and many blinds, a permanent crimp formed in the blinds to accommodate the peephole fashion to watch the brothers swear eternal enmity in redundant arguments on Saturday night. It was otherwise a quiet street. There was a man from the very end of the block who rode a bicycle too small for his size. Seeing him pedal down the street with knees making room for his belly, one thought of a circus clown. He always waved and always smiled. There was the man from across the street, father of the dueling brothers. Once walking on the street to the bus stop, I saw him up close for the first time after many years of watching them through the window. The distant vantage point had made me an expert in his gait and the slope of his shoulders. He walked like a man who was both broken by his family's perils but whose brokenness were the cause. Long before we were upon each other, I recognized him from afar. When our paths finally met, he nodded hello. I was startled at the face that greeted me. I did not know it. His eyes were yellowed, his face deeply creased. These were details not visible through the blinds. There was another neighbor whose walks I'd observed from afar long before coming face to face. I had seen her from the window and from the passing car. Her appearances in the street did not follow the pattern of a worker headed to the bus stop or fulfill any other purpose. She never carried bags from the convenience stores and fast food establishments located at the end of our block. She walked in the middle of the road, but the approach of a vehicle never seemed to startle her. She made way and then regained the center. Walking with the languid pace of a sleepwalker, she didn't seem to be pursuing exercise. She could be seen mornings and afternoons, but never after nightfall. She never turned into a yard making neighborly calls. Instead, her walks were more like promenades, more so because she was always dressed for the occasion. Invariably, she wore all red, red shirt, red shorts, red socks, and red shoes. Another variation was a red dress with red pumps and a red pocketbook. Often, and this seemed to be her trademark, she wore a red ribbon wrapped around her head with a long tail tumbling down, dusting the backs of her knees, ceremonial. Once I passed her while walking, she did not wave or in any other way acknowledge our crossing, unusual in this city of so few walkers. To find oneself in the middle of a street, temporarily emptied of cars, a body moving on its own power, not hurtled through space, is to feel part of a fraternity, people who kept measure of the city by their paces. It was also a fraternity of the poor, looked upon piteously from passing cars. I felt rebuked when she did not speak or even nod. Observing her for so long had produced a one-way intimacy. Her eyes met mine without a hint of acknowledgement. She did not recognize the feeling of my eyes. Sometimes we would not see her. For some months, she would disappear altogether, but her absence was not missed until she had appeared again. Oh, there she is. Where had she been? Any variation in dress was noted. Eventually, my mother heard a snippet of her history from a neighbor. There had been a car accident many years before. That was the reason she was the way she was, unsmiling and eternally red. One resorted to speculation to fill what could not be seen. Immediately, I conjured a circumstance to fit the few available facts. The accident had happened while she was escaping from home. Perhaps she had snuck out in the night, walking to meet a car waiting around a corner, it had arrived coasting and with headlights dimmed. Someone watched through the blinds as she went, or else she went slamming doors in defiance, waking the neighbors who were used to watching her leave like that, always wearing that red dress. It had all been arranged in advance. My scenarios did not determine whether she was running from something or running to something, but she had declared that she was never coming back. Then they were off. In the dead of night, the highway is all lit up, empty and glorious. Her hand stretched out the window, catching gusts of air. 
It had all been arranged in advance. The route had all been worked out. Soon, she was carried back the way she came. It was more than I could see from the windowsill. I decided that in those walks up and down our short street, she was retracing her steps, reenacting her flight on the open road that is now her mind. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My directive, manual, inspired by the Manual for General Housework from Sidia Hartman's Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, Intimate Histories of Social Upheaval, meaning of or pertaining to the hand or hands. The following research and installation images are a selection from a two-year project with the DIA Foundation in New York, specifically DIA Bridgehampton. With even more specificity, thinking beyond title and deed, it is also the site of the Shinnecock Indian Nation who have lived on Long Island, the northeastern shore, the northeastern coast of the United States, in close contact with the Atlantic Ocean for approximately 13,000 years. And in the purview of Freedman's Towns, of which most notable Freeman, Freetown, East Hampton, Long Island, and Eastville, Sag Harbor, Long Island. And the residue of settler colonialism beginning in 1640. I'm interested in this entanglement, its past, present, and future echoes. Such encounters are the basis for my response to the call of this conference, loophole of retreat, and the ideation of Harriet Jacobs by way of Simone Lay, Rashida Bumbre, Sidia Hartman, and Tina Kemp. The images are set as a counterpoint to the quotes, questions, titles, research vignettes, and studio notations that will follow. The title of this presentation is Untitled Birthmark, a manual for sculpture as an analgesic, acting to relieve pain. There are seven sections. They are as followed. Untitled Birthmark, a manual for sculpture as an analgesic, Two, how to handle ruptures and the unimaginable. Three, how to riff. Four, how to mend. Five, how to reposition. Six, how to embody. And seven, how to ritualize. Untitled Birthmark, a manual for sculpture as an analgesic, section one. Try describing the alienation and bizarre sensation one feels while looking, reading a map of this sort. The banality of its charting and impressive marks, delineating, measuring, a strike, a striving for an exactness relating to the depth of the Atlantic Ocean. Aiming to soften its currents, subdue its waves, storms, and eerie calm through lines and angles, a system of making sense, flattening space and time. But what if the unchartered, the unpictured, is irresolute, yet resolute sites of catastrophe, sites of new beginnings, births, illnesses, desires, struggles, collaborations, love, longing, fighting, healing, and sensing despair, all entangled, yet laying there, flat, still unpictured, underdeveloped, beyond capture? And how to square or to encircle this drawing map with the sensation of knowing, a kind of welling up and sensing there is more, there is more here. How to handle ruptures and the unimaginable, section two. Art historian Griselda Pollock explores the concept of, I quote, encounter object as a model to move beyond the restrictive dichotomies of word and image, verbal and visual language, object and text, and into the politics of difference via an understanding of interpretation as collaborative activity solicited by the artwork as an event 
that precipitates an encounter with difference, end quote. This position opens up considerations of why make, why work, why aim to understand in physical, tangible terms, material terms. For Pollock, she takes her cue from theorist and artist Brusha Ittinger and explores her argument that it is the destiny and desire of artworks that it, it excuse me, that is to be interpreted. Via the suggestion of curator Oluremi Onubanjo to read The Black Shoals, Offshore Formations of Black and Native Studies by Tiffany Lethabo King, a poignant section of the book titled Beyond the Iconicity of Black Labor deepens and expands this question of how to handle ruptures and the unimaginable in the following precise ways. And I quote, while labor is important, when it is used as the exclusive governing analytic in the scholarship on US slavery and U US settler colonialism, it hides more than it reveals. Specifically, labor as a governing frame obscures other processes, relations, locations, and symbolic economies that black bodies and representations of black embodiment produce and sustain. Labor, the one particular and useful frame of analysis, for analyzing colonial and subsequent capitalist contexts imposes its own totalizing regimes of reason and visuality. To obscure, to sustain, and to subvert totalizing regimes of reason and visuality describes forms of navigation, a choreography of sorts made by individuals or large masses of people and a forming in spatial terms towards a free form a freedom of movement, a building of a multiphonic, polyrhythmic cacophony. How to riff, untitled basin, hmm, hum, or him, that is H-M-M, H-U-M, or H-Y-M-N, section three. Cinnamon, released in 1962 by artist Nina Simone, acts as a reminder of the poetic and poignant echo and transformative power of words, utterances, sounds, modeled and handled to evoke all of the unsaid, but felt deeply in the in-between, in the negative spaces, the boundlessness of silences across generations living in the realm of post-memory. You know how it goes. Oh, sinner man, where are you gonna run to? Sinner man, where are you gonna run to? Where are you gonna run to all on that day? We got to run to the rock. Please hide me, I run to the rock. Please hide me, run to the rock. Please hide here all on that day. But the rock cried out, I can't hide you. I ain't gonna hide you here all on that day. How to riff, untitled Shinnecock Bay Atlantic Sound. I said rock. What's the matter with you, rock? Don't you see I need you? I run to the sea, I run to the sea all on that day. So I run to the river, I run to the sea, I run to the sea all on that day. How to riff, untitled, bay, valley, rift. Sedimentary rock starts forming when soil and other materials on Earth's surface are eroded and settle, forming one layer of sediment. As time passes, layers build and undergo intense pressures. Rocks are formed and reformed. Melted rock may come in the form of magma or lava when it is found underneath the Earth's surface like granite, pumice, and obsidian. How to mend, section four. Returning to King, who argues that, quote, to look at and contend with the fact or experience of slavery the enslaved bod black body presents a remainder and something in excess of labor. The black enslaved body is always something more, a fungible, expanding, and becoming fugitive state. Furthermore, a focus just on the black laboring body may preclude thinking about the ways that black bodies are imagined within other symbolic economies, such as conquest, native genocide, the Cartesian notion of nature, colonial taxonomies, and ecological destruction, end quote. 
how to reposition section five. By approaching image and object repositioned as interrelated and as inseparable modalities, it is an expanding immutable form in space. To expand a form of address, an address towards spatiality that includes geologic time, pointing to a deep time measure. Can this happen through the explore, exploration of ideas relating to light, sound, and inertia as they are pulled into a spatial matrix of image, object, echo, a close parallel to an idea, feeling, or event? These are not rocks, but amalgams, an echo of a different sort, merging the fragments of the depths of the typography of the Atlantic Ocean with the contours of calm water bays, inlets, where land curves inward to receive the memory of currents that traveled long distances, you know, ocean waterways. Can such formations be part of a continuum of what art historian Richard J. Powell describes as a blues aesthetic? This mode of idiosyncratic expression influenced by the black musical tradition of the blues, creating phrasing, repetition, and at times syncopation as spatial and space making, archiving, layering, and building. How to embody, section six. Eschewing containment by calling on light and the surrounding landscape, no longer pictured, but felt, experienced, reminded, internalized, and humbled. How to ritualize, section seven. Resonance, the quality and a sound of being deep, full, and rever reverberating, the reinforcement or pro prolong prolongation of sound by reflecting from a surface or by the synchronous vibration of surrounding objects. Consider the use of a fluxus score to proliferate, repeat, and acknowledge in collaboration with artist Jamal Cyrus, Jason Moran, Emmanuel Wilkins, and Rashida Bumbre. And here it is. For a solo piano, alto saxophone, or tambourine, the score may be realized in any imaginative way or in conjunction with or, or in response to the recording of the song, Evidence, Justice. Thank you. Um, I'd first like to say thank you uh, to Simone, Rashida, Tina, Saidia, to all of you who are here, Ooh, to the many, uh, many speakers today that have left me in awe and often speechless. Um, thank you. I'm going to read from a section of my novel, The Shadow King, which is set during Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia in 1935 in an attempt to colonize uh, the country. The book tells the story of the war from both the Ethiopian and the Italian side, um, but also features women who enlisted in the Ethiopian army to fight against the fascists. In this particular moment of my book uh, that I will be reading, uh, two of those soldiers, a woman named Aster and another woman named Hirut, have been taken prisoner of war by the Italians. Uh, and this is one moment um, the Italians, under the orders of Carlo Fucelli, uh, will be making photographs of them to remind everyone that they are, in fact, just women. At the end of this, if you will oblige me, and if Rashida's tambourine doesn't go off, um, I would like all of you to join me in an incantation of a section I wrote for the chorus. Um, and today's events have reminded me that uh, we are, if nothing else, a chorus. Hirut, 
blinks wildly in the new morning sun. There is an entire army looking at her eagerly, but all she can do is stare at Fucelli and his woman and the cook. Hirut stumbles backwards, made dizzy by the sight of this woman whose disappearance she has learned to accept as a certain fact in a confusing world. She presses her back against the prison wall and sinks down. She is clothed, but she is naked. She is a spectacle, but she is invisible. She is a girl who has been split, and what stands here is both flesh and shadow, bone and silhouette, no more than air filled with smoke, and the cook, the cook, the cook. Hirut looks at the woman, but the cook shakes her head, and her mouth trembles, and there are no words needed for what she is telling Hirut. Do not act like you know me. Do not look this way. You must find your own escape. Navarra is inside the barbed wire fence, his camera held up like a shield. Somewhere next to her, the ghost of Beniam tugs at her feet. Time melts and spins her senseless in this broken place where the cook can stand on the other side of a prison fence and watch her without offering to help. Hiru shuts her eyes and tucks her head. She extends a hand to an imaginary Aklilu, lets her rifle rest across her back, and she waits. Ettore stares at Hirut crouched and shivering violently against the prison wall and feels his anger fading, giving way to remorse and pity. She is, after all, no more than a native, no more than a girl accustomed to harshness. This is a body unbroken by servitude and orders. This is a girl buoyed by the endless calls to serve. Here she is before me, Father, slumped low like a dying beast, waiting for me to offer her relief. Ascari, Fucelli says as he points to two guards, make her stand up. Navara, get ready. But Hirut refuses to be moved, even when the Ascari pry her head up and her shoulders down. If she doesn't get up, tell her I will throw her over the cliff myself, Ibrahim. Colonel Fucelli says, Fifi and the servant step back, step forward slowly. Ettore notices that Hirut is so troubled by the sight of the two of them that she barely protests when Ibrahim approaches, tugs at the top of her dress by its shoulders, then pulls it down to her waist. The material rips. Hirut looks down at herself dazed, then at the two women, and whatever it is that engulfs her becomes too much to bear. Ettore takes a step away from Hirut. He doesn't want to look at her. He doesn't want to be inside this barbed wire fence listening to the mutterings of this terrified girl. Groups of soldiers gather closer. The colonel's madama and her servant hunch into themselves, their arms crossed identically in front of them. Neither of the women can look at the girl. It is the girl who cannot stop staring now. She is fixated on the two women, her trembling growing more pronounced as her mouth opens to form a word she cannot push into sound. The colonel moves next to Ettore, a hand on his pistol. Navarra, he begins. Last week, a unit nearby was nearly wiped out in an ambush. We know Kidane's rebels are hiding in these hills. We know some of them are women. Take the picture, soldato. The girl is swaying, her face lifted to the sky, the scar on her collarbone rising up in her deep, heaving breaths. Tell her to keep still, the colonel says. Aren't you an Italian? This is what Ettore sees when he looks at the girl that there is a dying away that happens in a breathing body. There is a tumble into oblivion that occurs while we are still inclined toward movement. Hirut cannot stop blinking and mouthing an inaudible word. She is swaying and bending to the ground. She is giving up. Ragazza, ti prego, fai così. Stand still, raise your head. 
at Tore lifts his own chin and an emotion like pain surges inside his chest. He holds his hand out to the girl, but she will not look at him. And for the first time, he wonders if he is worthy. At Tore raises the camera to his eye and finds relief. Through the viewfinder, she is just a small, lonely figure, parts misaligned until he focuses and puts her back together. Askaro, the colonel, points to Ibrahim. Tell her what happens to those who don't obey. Ibrahim steps to the fence, fearsome and splendid in his uniform. He pauses. His mouth wavers from its usual sternness. He whispers something to her so softly that it sounds like a brush of breath. Hirut's defiance slips away. She gets to her feet and places both her hands behind her back and plants a foot up against the wall. She stares at Ettore, her eyes full of spite. She wants to launch herself from there, he thinks. She, want, he, she wants to make a bullet. She wants to become a bullet spinning toward him and into his chest. He takes a photograph and advances the film. He readies, readies the camera again. She doesn't move, so he takes another photo. Then he waits, and Ibrahim mutters under his breath. When she still doesn't move, he snaps another photo, identical to the one before, and another, and another, and another, and another, and once more. Then he stops, unsure of what to do, a slow panic building inside him. Colonel Fucelli pushes Ettore aside. He pulls Hirut away from the wall and walks around her in a circle that shrinks until he looms close to her, glaring into her face. Hirut stares past him as if he is invisible, as if he does not matter. They stand like that for so long that Ettore moves in and photographs Hirut. He kneels and frames her dusty feet and slender ankles. He stands and captures the slope of her neck and the well-formed head that refuses to bow. He frames her face and shoots again and again and again. He does not know when Fucelli comes to stand beside him, but the man's fists are knotted and he is swinging in the direction of Hirut, who stands immobile and impassive, the slide of her eyes toward Fifi and the servant, the only hint of what might be pride. Ettore steps closer, propelled by Fucelli's shoves. He knows the lens cannot focus at the short distance that the man has pushed him. But Ettore takes photos of Hirut's eyes anyway, knowing only he will ever see the way hatred sways so easily between shame and fear. I am doing as I've been ordered, Father. I am the beast bound by obedience. I am the creature buoyed by calls to serve. Then it is Aster's turn where Hirut was quiet and defiant. The older woman is movement and noise. She is a body crashing through restraining hands, spinning so wildly that Ettore cannot take a photograph. When the top of her dress is pulled down, she pulls it up. When she is pushed against the wall, she slides down to the ground. When the colonel comes to yank her upright, she grabs his legs to throw him down. She screams a name that makes Ibrahim flinch and the Askari pause and even Fucelli says, now I have solid proof that they work for that rebel leader. Hirut leans exhausted against the doorframe, watching Aster with a trembling mouth, her hands on her face. The more the woman refuses to be stilled, the more Hirut begins to move. She opens her arms and swings her hands. She spins out of an imaginary hold. She is beautiful movement reduced to its most essential parts. Ettore angles away from Aster and leans toward Hirut. He adjusts the shutter and darkens shadows. He makes her a slender figure trying to find her, trying to find her rhythm, caught in a stunted pirouette. And now um, I'm going to read this chorus and hope that you will join me in the second iteration of it.
Sing, daughters, of one woman and one thousand, of those multitudes who rushed like wind to free a country from poisonous beasts. Sing, children, of those who came before you, of those who laid the path on which you tread toward warmer suns. Sing, men, of valiant Aster and furious Hirut and their blinding light across a shadowed sun. Sing of those who are no more. Sing of the giants still amongst you. Sing of those yet to be born. Sing. Chorus. Ready? Sing, daughters, sing, and 1,000 of those multitudes who rushed like wind to free a country from poisonous beasts. Sing, children, of those who came before you, of those who laid the path on which you tread toward warmer suns. Sing, men, of valiant Aster and furious Hirut and their blinding light across a shadowed land. Sing of those who are no more. Sing of the giants still amongst you. Sing of those yet to be born. Sing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, deep gratitude. I want to thank um, the organizers for including me. I also want to thank um, the generosity of thought. And uh, in honor of this loophole of retreat conve uh, convening in 2022, I share from my biography as a dissident writer currently living in exile, an ex-prisoner and ex-convict who served time for writing a poem and a radical queer African feminist producer of insurgent knowledge. I offer some considerations of um, possibilities. How does this work? Okay, possibilities of reclaiming freedom for creativity and critique while in exile, imprisoned, marooned, displaced, torn away from one's roots. My name is Stella Nyanzi. I had been living with my three teenage children in a two-bedroom apartment in the city of Munich since January 2022, when I fled from my home country through the facilitation of a scholarship from the Writers in Exile program of Penn, Germany. In spite of numerous attempts by misogynistic apologists of dictator Museveni's repressive militant authoritarian regime to dismiss, discredit, and deny the facts, I insist on self-identifying as a political exile because I fled from political persecution, including numerous arrests and police detention, prosecution, imprisonment, torture during detention leading to the miscarriage of my pregnancy while I was a prisoner, unjust exclusion from my employment at the oldest public university in my country called Makerere University, being slapped with a travel ban when my name was put on the widely dreaded no-fly list, also an application by state prosecutors to subject me to involuntary mental examination, several raids on my home while my children were watching or waiting or sleeping, the trailing of our family car even as it ferried my children to and from school, the freezing of my bank accounts, among other forms of targeted persecution. Yes, I am still a dissident poet, a dissident professor, a dissident protester, and a dissident political animal in spite of the political persecution I have underlined. Prior to starting my temporary ex exile in Germany, in 2021, last year, I lived with my three children in Nairobi, Kenya, where we briefly applied for asylum. Now, why would a well-meaning black African mother twice disrupt the lives of her three children 
by respectfully and respectively fleeing to seek for asylum and later fleeing to exile as a persecuted writer. Why? What dire desperation would drive a mother to dislocate, disgorge, displace, distant, and remove her children from the assumed safety and security of home? Well, my deep desire for freedom did not allow me to remain shackled by the repression, suppression, and oppression engulfing Uganda, my home country. My free speech, free expression, freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, academic freedom, freedom to write and freedom to criticize abusive state and institutional power had first made me an endangered species in Uganda. Safeguarding my sovereignty, my autonomy and security necessitated quick flight and exodus from all that I held dear. I was arrested, charged, tried, prosecuted, found guilty, convicted and sentenced to 18 months in maximum security prison because of a poem, a work of creativity, a birthday poem I wrote for dictator Yoweri Museveni in 2018. Charged with cyber harassment and offensive communication against the president, I spent a total of 475 days, including the end of 2018, all of 2019, and the beginning of 2020 as a political prisoner of conscience, locked up in maximum security prison. Not only am I the only Ugandan to be twice charged with the same crime of writing deemed to be offensive to the president and or his family, but I was also the first Ugandan woman to be charged under the famous, infamous Computer Misuse Act. Earlier in 2017, I was abducted from a private vehicle by gun-wielding men, held incommunicado for four days and later arraigned in court where my Facebook post metaphorically calling dictator Museveni a pair of buttocks was deemed a form of cyber harassment and offensive communication. Yes, you may laugh, but they did not. I was remanded to maximum security prison where I spent 33 days and was subsequently released on bail. The state attempted to subject me to forced mental exam during this trial. In the misogynistic state's logic, a woman must first fall mad in order to criticize the president with mere poetry. For a mere poem and a mere Facebook post, Museveni's dictatorship unleashed the whole arsenal of judicial and penal structures of punishment upon me. Alas, a lone woman's creativity shook authoritarian military might to the core. So if state penalization was aimed at curtailing and terminating my freedom of expression, my defiant desire for free expression on my own terms failed the dictatorship's logic. While I was punished with imprisonment for 475 days for one poem, when I was a prisoner of conscience, I wrote several poems that were frequently smuggled out of my maximum security prison, and I published them into a book. Uh huh. Um, which I entitled No Roses from My Mouth, Poems from Prison. Thank you very much. My desire and practice to, my practice of freedom to create and critique overrode and overpowered the painful penalization of prosecution and prison. This deep desire for freedom transformed prison into my own loophole of retreat a productive place for writing new poems published to coincide with my co acquittal and release on appeal to the High Court. Although several of my poems were confiscated and destroyed with fire by prison wardresses in my presence, the transgressive publication of 194 fresh poems when imprisoned because of just one poem was an outright act of radically rude resistance against repressive silencing by a punitive militant dictator. Poetry, creativity, won against their guns. So if prison was a productive place and posture pregnant with poetry, how much more exile today? In 2021, while living hidden in a safe protection house on the outcasts of 
uh, outskirts of Nairobi City, I penned the bulk of poems that went into my second book, a uh, collection of poems called Don't Come in My Mouth, poems that rattled Uganda, nothing sexual, all political. To the fresh poems focused on the hopelessness of post-elections Uganda, I added older poems I had previously posted on my social media platforms, including the poem for which I served 477, 475 days in maximum security prison. The poem, Yoweri, Yesterday, They Say It Was Your Birthday. So the sources of creativity are ample even when torn away from home. This year, 2022, when faced with exile, the painful frustration of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the lifting of COVID-19 lockdowns, I appropriated the death of an enabler of dictator Museveni to write a book of 57 poems for his 57 years on earth, which was published as eulogies of my mouth, poems for a poisoned Uganda. Continuing in the edgeless anti-colonial tradition of radical rudeness, I subverted custom and cultural mores by dancing for joy at the news of death of a notable leader of influence and power. Thus, I wrote protest poetry, inviting others to join the poetic protest. In exile, they will not imprison me for this. Similar to Harriet Jacobs, who wrote while marooned, hidden away and removed from the safety of home, I have written, composed, compiled, and published creative critique of power at diverse levels of the life that I observe and live in. This is my right. I refuse to be silenced. I remain rebellious. Currently, I'm working on two writing projects, one entitled Smoking Gun From My Mouth. No, I don't smoke to be published by my former publisher, and the other, a compilation of 475 poems to mark each of the 475 days I spent imprisoned at Luzira Women Prison because of a birthday poem written for dictator Museveni. I will write what was too dangerous to write while still at home. Exile, too, has some benefits. Living in Germany has suddenly led to an estrangement from already odious mainly because of language. I don't speak German. I am fortunate, however, that through my belonging to a fellowship of other persecuted writers in exile, Pen Germany creates opportunities for my creative works to be included with German translations into edited volumes of poetry anthologies and a poetry photo exhibition. I show pictures of my children, pictures I would never be able to show at home because of security. Common themes these days for me are about motherhood, failed motherhood, cross-border friendships, love in exile, the loneliness of freedom, and the quest for healing unseen wounds of political brutality. Although my themes evolve, my defiant dissidence persists. In my quest for freedom to create and produce critique and commentary, even when I am exiled from home, it is wonderful that I can draw from a line of genealogies of strong black African women who continued their creative productions, critical of oppressive power, when they were themselves marooned and displaced from their homes. Harriet Jacobs is a newly discovered ancestor, thanks to the thinkers of this loophole of retreat. I found her. Regaining, reclaiming, and consciously practicing my freedom of critical expression during imprisonment, asylum, and exile has echoes of fashioning sovereignty during marunage, a praxis handed down to us by Harriet Jacobs during her own loophole of retreat in the crawl space in which she lived for seven years after her escape from slavery. I am black. I am African. I am woman. I am in exile. I am a creative and a dissident. I was a creative dissident even when I was in maximum security prison. However, I'm neither special nor unique because there is a whole genealogy of exiled and or imprisoned black women who continued their creative productions and dissident criticism while in exile, prison, marooned, and thus I ride on the big shoulders of Winnie Mandela, Buzia Bena, Miriam Makeba, Nina Simone, Naval El Sadawi, Wangari Mathai. 
In African Ubuntu philosophy, we say, I am because we are, and we are because I am. Just as these dissident creatives are my ancestors, I want to be an ancestor of future dissident creatives who will find anchoring and sanity when they see echoes of my defiant resistance and refusal enacted through creative production, even when marooned, imprisoned, exiled, and removed from home. Not just removed, but torn from home. The aspiration to become an ancestor of future dissident creatives pushes me on in my quest to reclaim to reclaim my freedom for creative critique in exile. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sharifa, Leslie, Maza, and Stella. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that we have a bit of a break now before 5.45, um, when Annette Lane Richter will give um, closing. Um, and until that time, um, there is a film screening room, which I'd like to encourage you all to go to. You saw. Um, some of the films here today, but there are also other films by some of these same artists in the room, as well as a film by um, Alberta Whittle and Tourmaline, who are not speaking, but they're showing their film in that room, so I wanted to encourage you all to take time for that. Um, and, you know, we have a break now until 5.45, and I hope that you'll join us here to hear from Annette Lane Richter of the United Order of Tents. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming, good afternoon. It is our honor to introduce Ms. Annette Lane Harrison Richter. Um, what can we say about the incredible Ms. Annette? She has worked for the federal government since 1963. She is a frequent world traveler she is certified in advanced open water scuba diving. <laughs> <laughs> She's also active in Delta Sigma Theta, <laughs> the Lynx Incorporated. Anyone? No? Okay. No Lynx? No okay, Lynx. Okay. No Lynx. All right. Um, the Washington, D.C. Dames and the United Order of Tents. <laughs> she is also the great, great granddaughter of Annetta M. Lane, founder of the United Order of Tents. Mm -hmm. Please welcome to the stage Miss Annette Lane Harrison Richter. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you, Simone, Madeline, for that wonderful introduction. As they said, I am Annette Lane Harrison Richter, the great great granddaughter of Annetta M. Lane, who in 1867 founded the United Order of Tents of J.R. Giddings and Jolliffe Union. It is still active in nine states along the East Coast and the District of Columbia. The TENS, as it's known, is a fraternal insurance organization for women. 
Fraternal insurance means that they gather for social events, they transact business, and they also pay dues, which went toward a life insurance policy. Remember, we said it was founded in 1867, right after the Civil War. These women had absolutely nothing, but they wanted a good Christian burial, along with interacting with friends and relatives and neighbors. So, Annette Lane was a very, very religious woman, and she had a vision from God to band black women together to look after one another. So she founded this organization. And included in its name is J.R. Giddings and Jolliffe Union, who were abolitionists, whom she honored. And tents was chosen because tents literally were used to shelter slaves. And Netta was a slave on a plantation. And she had to take care of the plantation owner's children. She was also a nurse. And in that regard, she could travel freely about the plantation, carrying messages for slaves who were planning to escape. She worked with the Underground Railroad. She had a younger sister named Mary who worked in the fields. Mary was sold and Netta never saw her again. And I often think when I meet people, could this be a descendant of Mary? Could we be related? One will never know. But it's always in the back of my mind, knowing what those enslaved people went through, and it was awful. But Annetta did what she could to alleviate their suffering, and to help them adjust to a better life. And 10 sisters loved one another. We always call one another sister. We refer to one another sister. Someone once asked me how long I had been a member of the tents. And my response was, since the day I was born. So tents is such an integral part of my life my background, my personality. And Netta Lane taught herself to read and write secretly, secretly, because we know that slaves could be killed if they learned to read or write, even tried it. So she had to do it in secret. And I ask myself, how does one learn to read and write when you're under the thumb of your enslaver? How does one just go about doing something like that? So I've come up with a few suggestions that perhaps you can add to them. <laughs> I hope you can. We'll never know, but we can try. So first of all, she was a house slave which meant that she had to take care of the plantation owner's children when they had their lessons. So she undoubtedly sat with them in their classroom. She probably sat in the back of the room. After all, she wasn't a student by any means. And she stared out the window, you know, looked at the birds, the flowers, and whatever, because she could not let anyone know her purpose her secret, her mission. She wanted to learn to read and to write, but no one could find out, no one. So she would sit there, you know, as we use the term lollygagging, just being completely disinterested. But I'm sure every once in a while she stole a little glance at what was going on around her, and she listened intently to everything that was said. And there were probably times she put her head on her desk, pretending she was taking a little nap. But she was still listening. So she secretly taught herself to read and write. But remember, when she left the classroom, there was work to be done in learning these new skills. So after the classes were over, 
She was probably told to stay there and clean up behind the children, which she did. But in cleaning up behind them, what did she do? She slipped writing instruments and little scraps of paper into the pockets of her apron or her dress. And then later that night, after the chores were done in this pathetic little cabin in which she lived, she probably took out the writing instruments, the pieces of paper, and she practiced. She had listened intently early in the day. So by the light of a kerosene lamp, an oil lamp, or maybe the fireplace, she would practice writing and reading. So when she was freed, she was literate, but we still haven't gotten through to the full story yet. She couldn't let anyone know what she was up to. No relatives, no neighbors, no trusted friends, because this was a slave environment that was full of brutality and cruelty. So some slave might slip up one day and make some comment to the plantation owner or the overseer or someone else who had control over them that Annetta was learning to read and write. So she couldn't let anyone know. So after she had done her little practice for the night, she probably threw the writing instruments and the papers into the fireplace and let them burn, let them be destroyed. All of them may have had just a dirt floor in this pathetic little cabin, so she would dig a little hole maybe and bury these things and retrieve them later and study. But can you imagine the stress she was under all the time? And we get stressed when maybe our cable goes out for a few minutes. <laughs> our iPhone's not working and we have to call the provider, something like that. That's stress to us today. But stress to her was totally different because her very life depended on it. So this went on, I imagine, for not just days or months, but years, years and years until she learned to read and write. So when she was freed, she was literate. And she was able to organize these formless slave women into the order of tents. And as I said, ten sisters love one another. There's two sections. There's a juvenile department, and then there's the older uh, section to which one graduates after uh, reaching a certain age. And they always call one another sister. That gave them a dignity. Sister Richter. I wasn't just say Annette. I wasn't just say referred to as hey you, or even more vulgar and demeaning terms. But among my 10 sisters, I'd be Sister Richter. That gave me dignity. That gave me a persona. That gave me character. So from an early, early stage, 10 sisters have used means like that to advance one another, to make one another feel good. Annetta lived to be 70 years old, even after all that stress. She built a house in Norfolk, Virginia in 1900 that has stained glass windows in the entrance foyer, marble fireplaces, and even a butler's pantry. Now, can you imagine a formerly enslaved woman having a butler's pantry? But Annetta did it because she had persevered. She had tried so hard, and she had brought black women together to look after one another. So she had accomplished so much. One night after dinner, she became very ill, too ill to go upstairs to bed. So the family dismantled her bed, brought it downstairs, reassembled it, and she died there in 1908. My brother and I were the fifth generation to live in that house. I understand she said she was going to build a house for generations of her family to live in which we did. 
So if she was a woman of vision, and this is what we must continue today, having vision, perseverance, gumption. I had the occasion to speak on the, about Annette and the tents at that wonderful conference at the Guggenheim, and the comments were so warmly and genuinely received as they're being received today. So, I have vested in me the authority as the great-great-granddaughter of the founder, Annette Lane, and someone who bears her name, my first name is Annette Lane, for her. I hereby declare that all of you ladies are honorary members of the United Order of Chants. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, welcome. surprise. <laughs> I'm still a little in shock. This concludes day one of the loophole of retreat Venice. And we look forward to seeing you all here tomorrow morning in this room. Um, and the shuttle boat will start taking people back now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. And thank, thank you, you so, so much. much.